our students will be performing. Our students are in grade from grades two to grade eight. And we will be performing some Christmas music for you tonight. I hope you enjoy. Can I interrupt for a minute? We, <laughs> us we usually start with the national anthem. I wonder yes, if your choir going, could. Yes, we're going to start with the national anthem. Yes, Good. we are. Okay. And then Thank we'll do the Christmas. All right, all counselors, please rise.
Mr. Elliot returns the flag to its uh, capital. We'll start the meeting again. Restart the meeting. <laughs> Thank you, David. You're welcome, sir. Madam Clerk, are there any addendum or delegation items this evening? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, there are. Um, there is uh, one addendum item, um, that being correspondence from Niagara Region regarding uh, consent to increase the composition of Regional Council, and uh, councillors will see that's addendum item uh, 20. In addition, uh, we have a delegation that has registered to speak with regard to item 11, um, so council may wish to pull that item for uh, consideration earlier on in the agenda. Okay, well, I propose to do is to... Uh do we deal with items 1, 11, and 20 uh, in advance of the bulk of the uh, delegation items so that uh, those individuals here with uh, just those points of concern can uh, can hear their issues and uh, then we can move on to, to the meeting of the whole, allowing them to, to leave um, without having to sit through uh, perhaps a few hours of... Uh, of an interesting discussion. Anyway, uh, can I have a motion to confirm the agenda, please? Moved by Councillor Bodner, seconded by Councillor Doucette. Any discussion? There being none, all those in favor? It's carried. Are there any disclosures of interest this evening? There being none indicated, uh, I would ask that that's so noted. Uh, adoption of minutes. The regular meeting of Committee of the Hall 2517 held on November 27th. I'd entertain a motion to uh, adopt those minutes. Moved by Councillor Elliott, seconded by Councillor Demeray. Any discussion? There being none, all those in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Now we're going to have the discussion of those items, the determination of items that requiring separate discussion. Again, I've indicated uh, a suggestion of uh, Councillor Bodner. Items uh, 3, 11, and 19. Mr. Mayor, uh, item one and item 16. Thank you. Any more to my left? Okay, then to my right, Mr. Main. Item two, please. That's it, Councillor Main. Councillor Demery. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, items 17 and 18. Councillor Kenny, Councillor Mutt, Fireboard. And the items that um, I would speak to have already been lifted. Thank you. Okay. to deal with item 20 as well. Could uh, someone just, and that's an addendum item, 
Yeah. Regarding the counselor from West Lincoln. The counselor memory. Thank you. This time I call for approval of items not requiring separate discussion. Councilor Demery moved, made the motion. Second by Councilor Main. Any discussion? Being none. All in favor? Opposed? That was carried. We have a number of presentations this evening. Uh, the first of the presentation of uh, Tim Hortons. Is someone here from, to present from Tim Hortons? Would you come forward, please? And uh, Chief Cartwright, if you come up forward. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, Council members and staff, as well as the viewing audience and the people in the, uh, in the room this evening, this is a great opportunity for us. Uh, Tim Hortons are represented here this evening with Sean and by Sean and Tammy. Uh, they represent the three stores in the city that uh, raise money for us for our fire safety campaign over the course of uh, a week. Uh, I've spoken about this in the past to Council with regards to the, uh, the check that's going to be presented this evening. Uh, I'm also going to ask Scott and uh, my deputy, Mike Bendy, to come up, if they would please, to be part of this. Um, they were a big part in getting this organized and they were also a big part of making sure that it worked uh, in conjunction with Tim Hortons as well as our, fire our firefighters to be at the various locations at various times over the course of the seven days. We very much appreciate it and uh, Sean, if you'd like to say a couple words, by all means. Um, yeah, we, uh, we, we found out about the program they were running in town and figured it would be a good uh, opportunity for us to raise funds within the town and keep them in, obviously, our own city. Um, so we baked all the cookies, but everyone in town obviously purchased them and supported it. So when the firefighters came out and showed that it was worth, it was a worthy cause, we think it really helped out this year with our, our fundraising. So um, we couldn't help but thank the, the town enough and all of uh, all the firefighters that came out throughout the week and participated in certain events. And we think it was a su success. So thank you. Do you guys want to say it? No? Well, we uh, can't thank you enough for this uh, fire safety program. Chief Cartwright uh, reminds, us, reminds us of the uh, value of this program every council meeting and his frustration of families that don't have these devices in their home is, uh, is apparent and this will help us spread uh, these devices throughout the city and uh, we're, we're very appreciative and I think Chief Cartwright will uh, elaborate on that. Yeah, thank you very much, Your Worship. I'm going to speak just shortly about it now, but I will have a few comments later on with regards to an incident that occurred about a year ago. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that at this time, but maybe in a little while. Uh, the funds that are being provided by Tim Hortons through their efforts and the efforts of our personnel, and in particular the community as a whole, they'd be very supportive of this particular event. And that the number that you're going to see in a couple of seconds here is certainly going to show just, just how worthwhile this event was. So I very much appreciate it. and. Uh, by all means, let's uh, get on to the check presentation and uh, some photos. Okay. Your Worship, come down, please. It's uh, $8,295. Uh, yeah. right. We didn't eat all those cookies, by the way. I did go buy Yeah. <laughs> 
Tonight we have uh, another presentation, which is uh, an annual event as well as the winners of the uh, Christmas card contest. And uh, I, this time I'd like to thank all the children who participated in this, in this program for sending us our, uh, our Christmas cards. It's a little difficult to sometimes to pick out the winners. But as you see, the, uh, those who are, are first, second, third, and fourth, and fifth uh, cards are displayed here. We'll present, uh, they were on our Christmas float uh, uh, last weekend. And uh, we'll present these to the individuals who uh, are the uh, owners of them. They were the cards were blown up and put on the poster boards. And uh, we'll, again, I said they were displayed on the, on the, at the Santa Claus parade. And tonight, I'd ask you to take these cards home with you. We also have a framed copy of the card for each of you. For the front of the card, we chose a drawing by Daniel Adam, a grade eight student at uh, Oakwood Public School. Councillor Butters, if you could help me. Her drawing shows the Clarence Street Bridge. The bridge with City Hall and the museum in there as well. Typical pork open sites. Danielle included bright, vivid colors and lots of detail. Danielle, can you please come forward uh, to accept uh, a little acknowledgement? Uh, are we, they are on our Christmas cards for this year, and we have a, a number of cards for Danielle to uh, send out to her friends. Okay, why don't you uh, grab your Next, we have Christian Reed, a grade four student at St. John Bosco Catholic School, who provided us with a drawing of a boat at Christmas time. Is, Den is uh, <laughs> Christian here? Or is dressed up very nicely. I bet you you were singing in the choir, were you? We're presenting her with a frame and a sack of Christmas cards for her own personal use. Next is Ryan Lacroix. Lacroix? Lacroix. Ryan, can you come forward, please? Ryan is a grade five student at St. John Bosco Catholic School. And you were in the choir, too. You weren't in the choir. <laughs> Ryan drew a picture of a ship pulling Santa on a bookie board, passing under the Clarence Street Bridge. Now that's an original shot. Ryan can come forward and we appreciate it. Next, we have Emma Cruteau, another grade seven student at Oakwood Public School. How are you, Emma? Emma, his picture is the entrance of the lighthouses at the Welland Canal. And finally, we have Maya Shambrook, a grade four student at St. John Bosco Catholic School. Maya gives a drawing of children enjoying themselves in the snow at H.H. Snow Park. Now, we'll uh, have the children, perhaps, have the children stand behind these photos, or were they? No, we'll get them to the Mexico okay. right. Perhaps the parents could uh, come forward and take a a shot of the young artist? Yeah, turn your pictures around.
a number of delegations, but uh, we're going to have the delegation heard when the item for discussion is presented. And the first one we have is item number one. Mr. Elliott. And is Marilyn Corey here? Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, we'll just have the item presented first, then you can come forward. Yeah, she's coming up? Yeah, okay. Uh, Engineering and Operations, Engineering Division, Report Number 2017-177, Subject Request for Pedestrian Crossing on Clarence Street at Catherine Street. Is there a seconder for the recommendation? Councillor Kenny. Before we bone on it, Mrs. Corey, could you come forward and make your presentation? Thank you. I don't have to tell you now. No, but I had to push really hard. <laughs> so it was just, I was supposed to be here to answer or ask questions. I, okay. I'm waiting to hear what, what has been decided. We have some discussion on this issue. Um, Mr. Lee, any comments on this? To you, Mr. Mayor. Um, no, uh, the report's pretty straightforward. Uh, the recommendations are there. Um, as you can see, there's some budget item requests, depending on the decision of council, on which way they choose to proceed with the report and its recommendations. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Yeah, can you just paraphrase it again? <laughs> the uh, report has recommendations attached to it, which is in front of council and on the screen. Uh, that being said, uh, it, the decision will be as to which direction council wishes to choose to go uh, based on the expenditures, and there'll be budget items requested subsequently in this report, uh, depending on the decision. Thank you. Members of council, do you have a question? Start with Councilor Butters, then Councilor Demery. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, through you, do I suppose to, to um, Chris, so the two options that um, are before us really is um, the number one, which is not recommended, and that's you know the hundred and twenty thousand dollar one with the light and the whole kit and caboodle, like stop really like a stoplight, like at King and Clarence, right? No. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor uh, Butters, uh, the first option is uh, a reproduction, if you would, of what's on Main Street at Wellington. Okay. Where there's a stoplight specifically right. for the pedestrian crossing. Okay, so number two is the one that is recommended for $45,000. And and I did read the report and there was only two other ones in, in Niagara, one in Smithville and one in St. Catherine. So it isn't something that we're used to really seeing around. Is that fair to say? It's a fairly new... To you, Mr. Mayor, to Councilor Butters. Um, the second option that you had mentioned uh, that is a new system that has been adopted by the province there are two of them currently in niagara they're elsewhere throughout the province uh, they've been in being installed for the last pro approximately 18 months and that's the new system as it's detailed in the report with the attachments right. which shows the delineation on the pavement and then the subsequent <coughs> warning flashings and uh, pedestrian crossing information so so what so, like, would there be like a an education com component for for the citizens? Because um, you know, like, some people are used to hitting a button, the light turns red, they know it's it's safe to cross. This one here, it will it'll work differently. So, how are we going to make sure that the people, first of all, coming up to that, um, if that if this is accepted, that new um, light, if you will, that they're they're going to know what they're supposed to do plus the person that wants to cross over to shoppers or in that area, that they're safe and they're doing the right thing. Because the last thing we want is somebody, to, you know, to, to be heading out there thinking, oh, this is great, and bam, it's not. To you, Mr. Mayor, to Council Butters. As with any new traffic um, modifications, there's a learning process, a, a.k.a. an education process. Um, whether it be a stop sign or a traffic signal or a pedestrian crossing. Uh, this type of a crossing is the latest reiteration of what used to be in Toronto 
where they had the signs across the top and uh, the citizens simply stuck their arm out and then proceeded. Uh, this is a, through multiple discussions at multiple levels of government, this has been the, the option that's been brought forward in the province. And um, it's not just in Ontario, but it's also in North America now. So this is the methodology for doing a cost-effective pedestrian crossing within the province. But, but what specific steps do we take as a municipality to make sure that that education kind of gets out there? Are we going to be like putting it in our newsletter? Are we going to put it on our website? Are we going to make sure that there's maybe pamphlets or some kind of, you know, hard copy information that could be left at Shoppers Drug Mart, at a LeMay's, at a Marker Cafe, at City Hall, at the library, make sure that people know what they're doing at this, if this goes through at this particular crossing so that it's used correctly by both motorists and pedestrians. Through you, uh, Mr. Mayor to Councilor Butters. Uh, yes, that's definitely a possibility in doing as far as educating the uh, pedestrians. Uh, with regards to the traffic patterns, um, there will be signage, warning of the new scenario. Um, that's all part of that process. It's set out in the um, traffic standards. So th those warning signs would say that there's a new pedestrian crossing ahead. It would give those details. The lights uh, give the warning. So there is definitely a learning process in this. Well, I, I think it's uh, it's good to try new things, but I really think like that, that education part of it should be also incorporated in and whether we get information out through the senior centers at Friends Over 55 and um, the French one in, in, on the east side and in every available way just to make sure that the message gets out there for safety um, if this is going to go through. Thanks, Chris. Councillor Demmer. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you um, to Chris. Uh, Chris, I just want to let you know that I, I do believe that this is the, the best way to go. I think it's a, it, the uh, option two is, is the right type of crossing for that specific location. But coming from an active transportation uh, perspective, being the council representative on that committee, um, the committee has discussed this and had already used that type of crossing as uh, an example of the best, the best suited for that location. So the Active Transportation Committee is firmly behind this particular crossing. And I know that when we put the crossing on Main Street uh, by Wellington, there was an edu education component to that as well, because that's less user friendly than this one will be. So, um, and we had uh, brochures that were printed out by the city and I, I actually took them and delivered them to the nearby houses and to the apartment buildings so that the local uh, people that would be using the crossing would be more familiar with how to use it and what to expect when you do use it. So um, I'm sure that we'll be doing the same things again, but I think this is great. It's a long time coming and I'm glad to see that it's finally happening and it's the right crossing. That's just all I wanted to say. Thank you. Councilor Bodner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Chris. Chris, uh, tell me how this works. So we've got a blinking light, and uh, somebody comes up, pushes the button, it and activates the light. Um, is there a length of time? And I can just imagine that spot on a Friday that's very busy, and we want to protect people going across, but we're not going to see traffic backed up across the bridge because there's 50 people going across there pushing the light one after the other. Just explain to me how that'll work. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Bodner. Uh, as it, if you read in, into some of the detailing in the report, but I'll, I'll explain that in a little, little simpler terms, if I may. Um, the light in the act of crossing, flashing, is a continuous scenario. And the pedestrian has the right of way in the crossing. Once, and all the warning signs state that ahead of time, right. yield to pedestrians in the crossing. So if there is no person within that crossing, there'll still be a slowing down component to the traffic, but they will be able to proceed through. Once an individual is in that, then they indicate that they're stepping out, either by their, however, their hand or however, and then they have the right of way within that crossing. Okay. So then it's mandatory under the Highway Traffic Act that the individuals in a vehicle have to stop at that crossing when there's a pedestrian in it. Sure, and I think that's part of getting that information out, not just for the people that are walking. But we could see on a busy day, traffic stopped there for a, you know, a length of time, I would say, by everybody coming and going across there. there I just, uh, you know, I was concerned by that aspect also, where you would have cars then backed up, you know, could be quite a ways. And 
I know we want to solve one problem, but we don't want to, I think, uh, you know, create something else. But I guess we won't know that until we actually see it in action. But uh, you know, have, nobody's had that experience, I'm sure, if these are the recommended ones now. To you, uh, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Bodner, um, it, as you had indicated, it's a very uh, new system. It's only been around for a very short period of time. Um, we don't have any current information that would indicate the traffic volumes, pedestrian volumes, I should say, that would potentially be there in the market square scenario. But that's a learning lesson as well. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Bodner. Councillor Kenny, then Councillor Elliott. Councilor Kenny and Councilor Rain. Thank you, thank you, your, <clears throat> thank you, Your Worship. Excuse, excuse my voice. Um, I was told by the physician on call last night at the hospital I talked too much, so <laughs> told me to limit my talking. That that's why I have. So I'm going to do my best for you to hear me. The one thing I don't like about this design is right away if you read on there, you're talking about bump outs. I don't like bump holes. I, I don't think they're good. We haven't even finished. Uh, we've, we're doing our CIP, and, and we're going to be discussing all that. I don't want bump holes here. It says uh, it means to, to make the distance less for you. There's a curve that goes out farther. Oh, right. okay. So you have to kind of go around. It reduces, um, if you have read the report, uh, parking in front of the market cafe. Okay. and. Um, Lemay's meets because they don't want anybody parking in that particular area. But I don't like bump outs. Um, I, you don't have bump outs on Main Street, and it's a way busier street. Um, so, and you push the button and you get a chance to cross. So, I will not be voting if you're going to put bump outs there. What, what happened to you, Your Worship, to the grass? What happened to a simple stop sign? You stop, they cross, you move. That's it. And uh, so that's, that's about the best I can do. But um, I do think we have to address this area. Very important. Thank you, Marilyn, for coming forward and even making us more. We knew it, we knew it was there. But, uh, Thank you, Councillor. <laughs> Councillor Elliott. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, <coughs> Councillor Kenny. Um, as it, it's it, in the text of the report, there's comments about the, the pros and cons of a stop sign and the problems with that. Uh, stop signs are not recommended on arterial roads of this type uh, because of traffic congestion that they cause and all those issues, which is why staff didn't recommend a stop sign. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'll support the uh, staff recommendation. I have actually seen these in use um, out of province. Uh, as a matter of fact, in downtown Halifax, they have them. And actually, what Councillor Bodner spoke to is one of the issues that, that I did notice um, with the repetitive use of the crossing. Um, they're great because when they flash, there is there is no doubt you know where the crossing is, the lights, you can't miss them. Um, and, it, and it does identify there's a crossing ahead and stop for pedestrians when they're in the crosswalk. The only problem that I saw with it was that if one person pushed the button and the lights flashed and they walked across the road, everybody stopped. So that one person crosses the road, the lights go out over, over a period of time. And then one other person pushed the button and crossed the road. Now it didn't let, there wasn't enough downtime between crossings to allow the traffic to flow um, after the one person had crossed. So it became repetitive. One or two people would cross, the light would go out for a short period of time, somebody else would push it, traffic had to stop again, and it, and it backed up traffic. My question would be, can you program it so that once it shuts off after a specified length for crossing, can you stop it for a specified length of time, 30 seconds, 45 seconds, or a minute to allow the queued up traffic to clear before it can be activated again? Through you, Mr. Mayor, <clears throat> to Councillor Elliott, um, I would be very certain that that programmable feature would be available 
as an option to uh, the uh, software that controls the lighting and the switching. So that would be simply a timing issue. Okay. Um, you know, I'll speak on the positive side of the bump outs because one of, one of the problems that we've had with that intersection has been cars parked close to the corner where when people stop, step off the curb to cross, you can't see past the parked cars that are there. And cars that are traveling down Clarence don't get to see somebody till they've stepped out. This solves two problems. Yes, it reduces the, the width of the road to cross for pedestrians. But it also allows the pedestrians, if you take a look at the, at the, the drawing on page 20, and you see where the red line delineates the bump outs, it's only as wide as a car. But what it allows you to do is to be at the edge of the car so you can see past the car before you step out. If you take a look at the blue car on page 20, if you take that bump out away, that car, you have, you have to start walking, and people that are traveling eastbound on Clarence might not be able to see you behind that car as you go to step out. So at least this gives you a chance to see around the car before you step into the crosswalk. And for that safety feature, if it's only on this corner, on the, on the east side of Catherine Street in front of the Legion, we also have that planter box, and I think there's the big planter box and there's another circular one, I do believe. That's an issue for sight lines for people to see around. This bump out in this particular instance is for safety, so that people can see down the street without actually being on the street. So I would, I would look to support this as presented with the bump outs in place and that's for the rest of council to decide what they want to do, but that, that's, how, that's what I would support. Thank you, uh, Mr. Main. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, through you to Ms. Court. Which one would you choose? You seem to have done the research and... Well, I was hoping for the first, the first one, right? The same as they've got off at Wellington. Okay. But, having said that, this seems pretty viable. Why didn't you like the bump outs? Sorry, I, I, I'd like to say, Kenny. Councillor Kenny. I'm sorry. I, I, I just, I don't like them because it takes away parking off the street. Well, it isn't going to, is oh, it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's the engineering department. Mr. Um, Chris? Mr. Lee? How much parking would we lose because of the bump up? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to <coughs> Councillor Kenny. Um, essentially, it's just going to tip the ends off if you look at the sketch because there's the parking restrictions already from the corner, but this is the problem is, is that people don't adhere to those restrictions. And so they end up parking in areas where they're not supposed to. Um, legal parking stalls, if you look at this, there's really only one that's being <coughs> I don't think I taught what you said. There's still going to be parking on that street. Uh, yes, from the right corner. To... Well, it's not to the corner now. There's a space between the par one parking spot and the corner. Yeah, that's where the green part is. Here. Mr. Main, you had another question. Yes, uh, I can support anything that. that these, these people have done a lot of work on this. Uh, I prefer the Wellington one as well because you only use it when there's a person to stop by. Uh, to me, that flashing light to warn people of a crosswalk might be a deterrent for, for traffic. But having said that, uh, I don't have concern with traffic. We've got a population of, well, depending on which sign you look at, uh, I, I don't. I can't even get that into my mind that people would be upset about having to wait for the bridge and backed up. When, if you look at uh, Charlotte and King, we have a four-way stop there, four stop signs. It ain't a problem. So, uh, I would support uh, the recommended one, number two, uh, if that satisfies the people who are going to use it. I know that's putting the onus on you, uh, but. Uh, I would support either one of those. I would support the Wellington uh, business or uh, number two. 
Did I get the new one? Well, when I first came here to present it, when I, I said I would like one, but I didn't think I'd get it because of the expense, okay? So I was prepared to take whatever. But then Councillor Demery explained about what happened up at the um, Wellington, and it kind of threw me off because it's a regional road. So, and the re region refused to do it because they didn't see the need. So then Councillor Demery says, well, so we had to do it. Well, I was told that down here, if, if that was a regional road, there's no way the city's going to do it. So how come the city did do the one up there? And, and I may add, with a petition of only 48 names, and I put forth a petition almost 1,600 names, I'd like to know what the difference is. It's more Mr. Lee, can here. you comment on that? I think, I think he wants to answer. Do you want to answer, Mr. Demery? I think it was about four work. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mary. Through you, uh, I can tell you, Mrs. Corey, exactly what happened. We just got to the point where Councillor uh, Doucette and I were just hearing from the constituents in that area constantly. They put a petition together and there was only 48 names, you're correct. Um, but they kept coming to us and we finally got to the point where we came to Council enough times and just really got fed up with the whole situation said, look, you know, if the region doesn't want to pay for it, fine, let us do it. Put it to a Council vote and Council approved it. It was, that's how it happened. So if I keep pestering them, then I keep coming back and pestering them? No, 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 no. I think we're ready to make that decision tonight. It's just a matter of what Councillor May was asking you to do is pick the one you like best, and he would he would like to know that, what you like best. Well, That's I, all. I would like That's all it was. <laughs> I, I would like what's up there. Okay. And, and you like what is proposed. Pardon? You like what is proposed. I'd like um, option A. I think it's... Isn't it? Yes, it's the more expensive one, but you told me that the one up there cost 90000 And how come now they're quoting 100000 plus all the... Why do they have to do anything to the sidewalks and sidewalk improvements, which makes the price go up more? Pardon? Through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, they did. They had to do the same thing up there. There were probably costs that I didn't quote because I wasn't aware of, but uh, it was quite a pricey item um, it's because of the road. That's just how it is. It's more lanes as well. It's more traveled. Oh, we better go ask to our list again. Do I have it? Councillor Bodner. Councillor. Councillor Bodner, can you? Are you ready to go now? Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Chris. Chris, those bump outs, are they the rollover kind or are they an actual curb? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councilor Bodner. They can be either or. At this point in time, the, the thought was to put an actual physical barrier curb. Okay. With the appropriate um, barrier free accesses at the crossing. So the curb would drop and there'd be tactile surfaces and things of that nature. Okay. Council Barters? Yes, through you to Mr. Sinez. Is there money sitting in a reserve for this? And if not, how is it funded? Through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, this would be an item that would have to be brought forward in the 2018 budget. And what does a um, hundred and some thousand dollars represent as far as the percentage if, the, if we had to put it on the levy, for example? Through you, Mr. Mayor, it would be an item that would uh, more than likely come out of the existing capital levy. Okay. Are we all good as far as our questions go? Call for the vote. All those in favor? Yes. Does everyone understand what we're voting on? That's correct. Yep. All those in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Thank you, Mrs. Corey. So, I'm getting a second. Option two. The second option? Yes. May I ask when this will start? Mr. Lee? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, 
council at large, uh, we can initiate the design process immediately. Um, the only issue will be making certain that the council approves it in the 2018 budget to initiate construction. So we're going to wait on the council to approve it for the budget? Well, we've got to get the money approved. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yeah. How long will that take? Well, it's fair to say sometime in the spring, Mr. Lee. To give her a target date? Uh, to you, Mr. Mayor, yes. Uh, as soon as the budget's approved, the budget's coming through in the first part of the new year, I understand. So it'll be in front of council. Well, it'll be a little bit later than that, the first part of the new year. Mr. Sinez, do you have a more accurate? To you, Mr. Mayor, um, normally we, we do are, are able to provide uh, the approval of budget by at least the end of March. So it's a priority item from the end of March. So we'd hope to have you back late spring. Uh, have me back for what? To say thank you, Council. Oh. <laughs> I thought you meant you were going to give me another hard time. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> okay, very, very good. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Corey. Next is uh, item number two, Councilor Main. Oh, I didn't. Okay. No, oh, it has to be a doubt. No. Item 11, we advanced. No. And that is uh, Mr. Halinga is with us. Could we have that presented, uh, Councilor Rodner? Mr. Mayor, Planning and Development Report number 2017-168, subject Port Coburn Quarry Site Plan Agreement Status Report. Is there a seconder for the recommendation, Councillor Butters? Mr. Halinga, do you wish to make a presentation? Yes, please. And then we'll have a discussion up here for members of council. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, councillors, staff, and members of the public. Thank, thank you for allowing me to speak to item 11, Planning Department Report number 2017-168, which is being submitted to council for information purposes. I've requested permission to speak on this item based on the following. On page 132 of the councillor package, certain requirements of note for the 1981 SPA the last bullet, a passive recreation lake for pits two and three. This is not a requirement for pit one as confirmed by legal counsel. This is based on page 147, clause 14 of the SPA, which reads, the quarries has as a condition of licensing pursuant to the Pits and Quarries Control Act, agreed to undertake and maintain a rehabilitation program comprising a passive recreational lake which would only be used by sailboats, canoes, and rowboats. The quarries, however, reserve the right to change the type of rehabilitation program subject to concurrence by both the Ministry of Natural Resources and the City of Port Coburn and the resultant amending of this agreement. I would draw your attention to page 148 of the same councillor package, 1981's site plan agreement, clause 23, the quarries agrees to the undertaking and maintenance of a rehabilitation program compatible to the program contemplated in clause 14 of this agreement for that area west of Snyder Road being part of lots 23 and 24 concession two. For clarification, part of lots 23 and 24 concession two is referred to as pit one. There are two key items in Clause 23. Firstly, it must be a rehabilitation program. The second is the word compatible. The rehabilitation program must be compatible to a program comprising a passive use, recreational use, and a lake. The lake is the most critical for restoring the high vulnerable aquifer. An old rendering that used to hang in the quarry office reception area showed pit one, as well as pits two and three, restored as a passive recreational lake. 
and the community was led to believe that this was the agree agreed rehabilitation of the site and clause 23 is reflective of this suggestion. It is indeed the most compatible with the required adjacent passive recreational lake. If clause 14 contains certain requirements of note for the 1981 SPA pertaining to pits two and three, then clause 23 contain, contains certain requirements of note for the 1981 SPA per, pertaining to pit one. Whereas the planning report 2017-168 identifies the requirements for pits two and three, it does not outline the requirements for pit one. Schedule A has been compiled in plan form on page 162 of your package. Clause 32, page 150, references Schedule A as the lands on which the site plan agreement is registered on title, and this plan quite clearly includes Pit 1 on parcels 7, 8, and 9, and the intent of all the lands to be covered by the site plan agreement. Quarrying is a necessary activity. Quarrying is further recognized as an interim use with return to alternate compatible post-quarrying use directed in the license and for this quarry in the 1981 site plan agreement. Since quarrying in this instance was allowed below the natural water level, a water re rehabilitation is required. This is also within the designated and recognized high vulnerable aquifer. The alternative would have been to allow quarrying only to the top water level replacing the overburden and returning the lay lands to agriculture. This would reduce the volume of aggregate by about 50%. With the present lack of conformance to rehabilitation, it strongly indicated that perhaps any future quarry license should only allow the second alternative. I've heard it intimated that it will take 100 years for the quarry to refill with water. There's simple arithmetic to correct this misleading information. Port Coburn receives an average of one meter of precipitation per year. The quarry is mined to approximately seven meters below the natural groundwater level. By simple arithmetic, not counting infiltration or exfiltration through the rock, it will take a maximum of seven years for the top water level to stabilize. A site plan agreement is not a starting point for compromise. It's the culmination of negotiations. Without this approved site plan agreement, rezoning and OP amendment would not have been approved in this form and quarrying would not have been licensed in this manner. Perhaps the license should only have allowed quarrying to the top water level of the aquifer. Agreeing on a site plan, proceeding accordingly, and asking for changes after the completion of mining is not being forthright. The MNRF issues and controls the quarrying license now under the Aggregate Resources Act. The site plan agreement is a condition of the license, but the agreement is between the city and the quarry and thus cannot be enforced by the MNRF. So this is the responsibility that falls with the city. The site plan agreement in clause 17, page 147, also requires conformance with the Pits and Quarries Control Act, which is now the Aggregate Resources Act, and thus the city can enforce the stipulated license rehabilitation requirements for pits two and three and conformance of a compatible nature for pits one. On this basis, I respectfully request that Planning Department Report number 2017-168 be referred back to staff for further consultation and revision. Thank you, Mr. Alenga. Are there questions on this uh, issue? Or questions to Mr. Alenga? Mr. Bonner? Uh, questions to staff? Yeah, I was going to say, Dan, um, so we've heard what Jack has to say. Um, I believe in your report obviously differs. If you go back and do some more research, how would you what would you check to, to make sure that our report from the city is accurate? Um, the world according to Jack says it isn't. 
um, you know, how, what, what do you think would change if, if we send it back to you? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to yeah. Councillor Bonner, I've already consulted legal counsel, and they're going to look at the entire agreements again, but this time, I guess, with the fine-tooth comb based on Mr. Olinga's information. And then once that determination or opinion is given, I can inform council of that decision. And Mr. Mayor, that's, I think that's a reasonable, you know, Jack's brought up some pretty serious stuff that changes this report. And at some point we've got to get to, you know, uh, some comfort level we have that, you know, the report's carved in stone. So I don't think that's an unreasonable request for Mr. Linga to have us uh, send it back and I'd be happy to make that recommendation uh, after we hear from some other people. Mr. Elliott. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, through you, and I guess a uh, comment and a question. I support the rehabilitation of the quarries, and I'll state that publicly. When you go around and you take a look at all the other quarries throughout Ontario and, and states, they're all rehabilitated. And I understand that, that the owners of the quarry right now are going for rezoning. But my, my question would be, this was agreed to in 1982, correct? 1982-81. Through Mr. Mayor, uh, 1981 is the actual date of the agreement. 81, okay, is the date of the agreement. So prior to that, there was no license for pit one, correct? That's correct. And the owners, the owners of the quarry knew that at the time that they entered into this agreement, right? They knew that there wasn't a license for the quarry, so they weren't mandated under license to rehabilitate the quarry. Yet in this agreement, they put in Clause 23 that says, the quarries agrees to the undertaking and maintenance of a re rehabilitation program compatible to the program contemplated in Clause 14, which is the rehabilitation program for pits two and three. So knowing that they didn't have to rehabilitate one under, because there was no license, they openly accepted Clause 23 that says, the quarries agree to the undertaking and maintenance of a rehabilitation program. So what that says to me, and I'm no lawyer, and Jack's far smarter than I am, and the people that own the quarry are, but that says to me that while we know there's no license and we're not forced by law to rehabilitate, we're going to put that clause in because it's the right thing to do. So they've got it in writing that we're going to agree to rehabilitate even though we know that we don't have to. So is, is, is the intent of the agreement taken at face value? That when this was signed in 1981, that's what the owners of the day intended to do was to rehabilitate pit one. That's my question. Through Mr. Mayor to Councilor Elliott, I can't comment on that. The, I, I wasn't around in 1981. And I have no documentation in the files that say that the quarry was going to do that, but you are correct, it's in the actual agreement. And, and that's where I think part of the, a lot of the discussion comes from, is that yes, it, it's, not under, it's not under license or wasn't under license when it was quarried, but they did agree to, to rehabilitate under, or the, the uh, let me put my glasses back and I can read it. Agrees undertaking maintenance of a rehabilitation compatible to the program contemplated in Clause 14 for the other two. So they knew that going ahead, once they, once they finished off two and three, they were going to rehabilitate, and we're going to use the same program to re rehabilitate one as we did for pits two and three. I think that's admission that, that that's what site plan should be, is that here it is. We admit we're going to rehabilitate pit one as well as rehabilitate rehabilitate pits two and three so I'd like to I'd like to get a comment on that from from staff from legal if we can to see what their interpretation of that particular clause would be exactly. through, through Mr. Mayor to Councillor Elliott as I said uh, our legal counsel will be informing me as to what the actual agreement indicates needs to be done or can be done thank you, thank you. Councillor Demery and then Councillor Butters Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, through you, 
to Dan. Dan, uh, thank you for sending this off to legal. I think that's where it, it does belong. And I just wondered, do you have some idea as to when this is likely to come back to us? Through Mr. Mayor to Councillor Demaria, I, I talked to legal. Um, they are aware that I would like to have the uh, information sooner than later. I can't actually confirm when it's going to be received, but I hopefully, you know, my plan or goal is that it be um, sooner than later. Okay, thank you. And I just would also like to state that I, I also support the rehabilitation of this quarry, of all quarries for that matter. And um, I agree with both my fellow councillors on how we need to move forward with this. Councillor Writers. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I um, certainly. Um, I'm happy to second uh, this to go back to staff for the refer back to staff for legal to do a, a really good search on it. And I agree with Councillor Elliott totally. I think that when you know documents are, especially this kind of an agreement is negotiated, there was an intent back in the day. And and Mr. Linga was, was there back in the day, even if Mr. Aquilina wasn't. <laughs> and I'm sure his memory serves him rather well when it comes to something this important. Um, so I look forward to the day where we can finally push this thing forward into a rehabilitative state. And instead of um, waiting around for God knows what, um, because this this will hang around forever if you don't. That's the bottom line. I mean, it, it has hung around forever. And it's time to, it's time to um, just get it sorted out is my opinion. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Mr. Bonner, I think we're ready for a motion to refer if sure. you want to make it. And I'd, I'd like this referred it. back to staff for a, a thorough look, kind of a once and for all thorough look by the legal department that we have, um, and then come back with a report when we get it. Thank you. A seconder for that motion, Councilor Butters. <coughs> Any further discussion? Call for the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Thank you, Mr. Arlinga. Um, at this point, uh, we had agreed to pull item number three in the vans. I see Mr. McAvoy is now here. Um, I would call item number three then, and we'll deal with that, and then we'll go back to the regular <coughs> agenda. Run the Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Community and Corporate Services, Corporate Services Division, report number 2017-191, subject property and liability insurance policy renewal. Is there a motion or a second for the motion? Councillor Demaray, discussion? <coughs> Councillor Rodner? Mr. Mayor, there was a, item five of this says that staff direction be provided to the addition of any type of coverage for terrorism related activities. Um, I, I guess we hear from other counselors, but I don't think that should be first on our list for uh, adding to our insurance. Um, and barring any discussion that can convince me differently, I would say that that's not something we need on our insurance policy. I'll wait to hear from others, thanks. Perhaps we could hear from the insurance agent. Mr. McAvoy, do you have a response to Mr. Bodner's concerns? Um, do you have a specific question you'd like me to answer or, or well, just an opinion? Well, do we need the coverage or? for possible terrorism activities? Okay. Um, if, if you read my report, uh, you'll see that that was not one of my initial recommendations. Um, our goal is, uh, with all, everything we do with, this, with the city, it, it really comes down to two things. And number one is to transfer as much risk, risk as possible to the insurer and cover us ourselves off the best way and to get this best bang for our buck. So it, it's, you see that there's four items there. Um, would it be my first choice? No, uh, my first choice was to increase the liability, which I thought was a, a reasonable price and moving forward. So 
that sort of came out of uh, that was going to be one of my options to present anyway, but it sort of came out of discussions that came from special events, just from th things that have happened around the world and everything they see. Like, think of Canal Days, and you know we got into discussions of barriers and all this other thing, and and so it kind of naturally led to this, which is why uh, I think it ended up on the report is it's something for for you to decide. Um, all these options, any one of those options, it's it's a lot better to sit down after the fact when you've kind of got a number and then really hash through the risk and say, you know, what's the most I can lose from this? You know, if, if God forbid a terror attack came, I mean, I don't think any of us would really know what we're about. The other thing, too, that should be, is kind of important is that uh, that number for the terrors and liability, um, sorry, I don't have the number in front of me, if somebody can help me with that, it's 40... Whatever that number was, that was only for a million dollars. So, I mean, we, you know, what do we do? We need one. Do we need five? Do we need, and so on and so forth, and, and away we go. So, your your point is very well taken. Um, we have to assess our risk, assess our numbers, just like any other any other capital project you do. Thank you. Any other questions or comments, Jasmine yes, Demonder? Let me comment it. Thank you for looking after us as far as what we, you know, I would say we really need. Um, it's a good exercise to go through it, I think, and, and to see this there is good. But I think I could sleep pretty well at night knowing we didn't have that terrorism insurance. Um, so from my point of view, we don't need it. And uh, I would, uh, the recommendation I'd make is that we just not pursue that part of it. Item number five on there. Any other com questions or comments? Yes, Mr. Demery. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I would also be of the opinion uh, that Councillor Bodner has expressed with the terrorism and associated coverages. I, I just, I, I can't really, I hope to never imagine a time when we would be needing chemical, biological, and radiological and nuclear insurance, but. Um, and I know that those risks, they, they do stand out there, there's no question, but I just don't think at this time it's something we need to be considering here in Port Colburn. So I'm not, uh, I, I would be in favor of dropping that from the coverage. Yes, Mr. Elliott. Thank you, Mayor. Through you to Tim. Just a quick question, I don't know if you can answer this. <laughs> Councillor Doucette and I were just having a quick convo. Does St. Lawrence Seaway carry terrorism insurance yeah. um, because I mean it's kind of sort of more of a target than maybe us and just to know if they do just in case well, I don't have knowledge of their program but I'd be extremely surprised if they did not yeah. okay, okay. Um, from what I understand of the discussion here that you're prepared to move forward with uh, item number three, the leading point five. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, Chief. I hate to interrupt, but uh, if I could, I, I'd just like to make a point, and I'm going to, if I could ask uh, our uh, insurer, um, the city has recognized the cbr &E regional team, which Port Coburn is part of. So it's part of our core services. So that in itself tells me that we recognize a potential event that could happen somewhere in the region, not necessarily here, but within the region. We're part of that team. So I, I guess from a risk assessment, which I'm partly responsible for with regards to my emergency planning pr perspective of my job, um, do, we, do we try to uh, protect ourselves against a potential uh, event were it to occur in the city? especially I'll use canal days because that's already been spoken of this evening. So should we better protect ourselves? And if in the event we, we don't get this insurance, an event occurs and we don't do anything to try to prevent it or make us more secure, where does that leave us with our liability insurance? If I may, Mr. Mark what Mark. you've exactly described, if, if, if you recognize a risk and you do nothing to mitigate it, that's the definition of negligence. So that's when it would kick in. If we, if we take a step back, I mean, insurance has evolved over the last number of years. Originally, you know, 30 years ago, 
pollution coverage was included in regular liability. That came out and terror, everything, because all these things were not uh, thought of. But as, as it's come along and, and things have been pulled out, obviously we want to give the option to bring it back in. Now having said what, what you just did, you know, we had an initial meeting uh, with, with Mr. Sness and, and the CAO, and we talked about the kinds of things that could be done to help mitigate our risks uh, in an event. And uh, that's when we bring our risk manager in, because we talked about what kind of fencing to stop vehicles, what, you know, how big does a barrier need to be, does it need to be concrete, and so on and so forth. Some things you can do, some things you can't. So, I mean, you do what you can do. Um, you know, can I say that we'll never use any terrorism coverage? That's like, obviously, I can't say that. But I think we can work to not uh, have the same kinds of risks that might be just from doing nothing. And uh, an event is probably one of the easier targets, so to speak. So I think if we work with the special events or things that you're concerned about, and that's, that's what we have the risk managers for. Does that help? <coughs> I think so. Yes. Are there no more questions? Uh, uh, Mr. McElroy, we're content. Uh, perhaps uh, this has been suggested by our clerk that rather than delete number five, that we would uh, see what you've written there. The number five would be amended that uh, coverage, et cetera, on terrorism related actions not be pursued at this time. Still leaves the door open. <laughs> Mr. Rodner, do you want to make that amendment? I'm good with that, Mr. Mayor. And Mr. Butters or Mr. Demery, you're good with it? Second it? Okay, is everybody clear then on the question? As amended. All in favor? Opposed? That item is carried. I thank you, Mr. McElroy, for being here and answering those questions. Okay, I think at this time we should return to the agenda now that we have cleared the chambers of potential delegates. So I would move on to the mayor's report. Uh, as you all are familiar, Ashley Greg, our city council, our city clerk, who has been guiding us through our council meeting since 2010. Uh, I'm sad to say that Ashley will no longer be guiding us uh, through these meetings, and I, it'll be a personal loss for myself. However, the good news is uh, she will be joining us, table staff, as our new director of community services and economic development. Ashley, we wish you all the best in your new role, and we're uh, sorry to be losing you as a clerk, but uh, we encourage you to continue to uh, seek higher, higher aspirations, uh, aspirations but uh, responsibilities, I think is uh, the term. That's okay and, <laughs> and we hope you'll respond with the enthusiastic uh, way that you do to your present role. And I'd like, like to advise the city council that we are also advertising already for a new city clerk. And we'd also like to welcome Carrie McIntyre, uh, has assumed the new role as deputy clerk. And uh, we thank her for her dedication to, uh, to our CAO over the years. And uh, we'll be seeing a lot more of you in this chamber in the years and months to come. Thank you, Carrie. The Santa Claus Parade uh, was last uh, Saturday, and a big, big thanks to the businesses, organizations, and individuals who took time to decorate their floats, cars, trucks, motorcycles, four-wheelers, musical instruments, pets, and themselves to bring life and light to our annual Santa Claus Parade. I think it's uh, one of the premier Christmas events in the region. And uh, the, why it's so great, it's a community parade, and the community gets behind it, and uh, we all enjoy ourselves, uh, especially the children. And the, the crowds along the street were tremendous. Uh, they, they really were. And uh, the community appreciates you. 
all the efforts of the organizers of the parade. Uh, Jim Murdoch is not here, and uh, <coughs> Michelle Cuthbert, et cetera, but we owe a debt of gratitude to those ladies and the many volunteers. Uh, like Mr. Maine was directing traffic. Um, uh, Mrs. Emery was one of the judges. Uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Councillor Kenny was uh, handing out candy, as was Councillor Butters. Uh, <laughs> Councillor Natch was driving a huge truck. So the, the city council participated as well, and again, it makes a big, big difference. Uh, oh, Dave Elliott, too. Dave Elliott, you were, were you uh, handing out candy as well? So far behind. A good time was had by Hal on, in any event. Uh, New Year's Eve, the celebrations to ring in 2018 will start at the Valley Health and Wellness Center on Sunday, December 31st at 1 p.m., ending with fireworks at 6 p.m. So the uh, idea is bring out the whole family, have a good family New Year's Eve, and uh, there'll be games, swimming, skating, and lots of more. So uh, that's a community uh, Christmas Eve party, and uh, all are, are invited and uh, would appreciate your presence. Uh, the New Year's levy will be uh, hosted by myself and my staff on Monday, January 1st, from 1 to 3 at City Hall. Please stop by, say hello to perhaps your fellow councillors and members of the public. Uh, it's, a, it's a tradition which uh, we'd like to see continued. There'll be free family skates over the holidays, uh, sponsored by Tim Hortons, uh, at the Valley Health and Wellness Center on December 23rd and 30th at 7 p.m. and January 2nd and 5th at 1.30 p.m. Again, come out with uh, the family and participate. Another interesting item is the USS Little Rock. Uh, it's a new Freedom Class littoral combat ship. That means it operates close to shore. Uh, of the U it's a U.S. Navy. It's being commissioned on Saturday, December 16th in Buffalo Harbor. And we have unconfirmed reports that she will travel through the Welland Canal sometime before December 17th and the 19th. We don't know exactly when, but watch out for our posts uh, on our Facebook and Twitter accounts and come out and greet her as she passes through. We haven't had a, a naval vessel through the canal in a long time, and this is a brand spanking new one, which is on its way to, I think, Florida, we were the first posting. And that concludes my report. I would, uh, this time, <coughs> entertain uh, a report from Mr. Perry from the Regional Council. Good evening, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays. It's always a pleasure to be here this time of year, especially these meetings when we get to see our homegrown talent uh, singing and speaking, in this case, from St. John uh, Bosco, which I, I'm happy to be an alumni from that school as well. Um, so it's great to see. Um, congratulations to the city clerk as well from, for the uh, position um, change. I see skirted uh, the work involved with a, another election next year, so I'm sure that has something to do with your decision making. It certainly would be for me if I was in your shoes. Well done, as always. Uh, this evening, Mayor, I do have a, a couple of announcements, in particular with respect to the approval of the Region 2018 budget. The entire budget was approved last Thursday, totaling $1.1 billion, and we are ensuring the continued delivery of high-quality programs and services that the community has come to expect, and funding uh, is being maintained and approved for our infrastructure and assets. As with all budgets approved this term of council, as you well know, Mayor, um, the focus for 2018 is on balance. The budget approved last week, I would say, strikes a balance between taxpayer affordability, maintaining critical services and infrastructure, and making investments in strategic areas that will support a more prosperous Niagara. Residents will see a 2% increase on the region's uh, portion of the tax bill. Some of the highlights include an increase to frontline police officers, an additional 24-hour ambulance to provide quality, timely paramedic service, additional funding to support Niagara Specialized Transit, a service that provides transportation options for some of the most vulnerable residents in our community, 
funding to continue with the consolidation of public transit across the region, funding to combat the emerald ash borer in the Niagara region, and an initial budget allocation in support of the 2021 Canada Summer Games held right here in the Niagara region. Council also approved the 2018 capital budget of $189 million to support several significant projects, including about $10 million for general road resurfacing and repair, $3 million for new buses to enhance Niagara Region's uh, intermunicipal transit service, $9.5 million to support affordable housing in Na Niagara through the Niagara Regional Housing Corporation, and as I noted earlier in the year, uh, approval of $34 million plus invested right here in Fort Colborne infrastructure over the next three to four years. Again, I believe the 2018 budget puts affordability of our ratepayers first, while still continuing to fund things that our residents rely on every day. Council and staff work diligently to ensure this budget meets the expectations of our residents. I'm confident this budget will continue to move Niagara toward prosperity, and I'm particularly proud, Mayor, of the fiscal responsibility this, this council term has demonstrated with an average increase of 1.48% per year for 2015, 2016, 2017, and 2018. 1.48% on the, on the levy per year. Further, on top of the AA credit rating that has been sustained by the region through Standard & Poor's Index, the region recently received a report from the C.D. Howe Institute placing the Niagara Region budget reporting practices amongst the best in Canada. What does that mean? Well, when stacked up against other municipalities, Niagara explains the complexities of the budget in an understandable way. We use plain language, consistency in reporting across the organization. We make use of comparisons to previous years making budget presentations in a timely manner, particularly being fully transparent to ensure residents, stakeholders and councillors have a clear picture of how money is spent and how in particular property taxpayers' money is spent. Again, this report confirms the region's practices related to the presentation and communication of the annual budget are amongst the best in the country. Again, I'm proud to say that our budget is both open and transparent ensuring residents, business owners, stakeholders, elected officials truly understand how we're spending their money. Finally, Mayor, the region has committed to a continuous uh, improvement through the region's first ever internal audit plan. Last month, the region took the step forward, improving its internal controls and practices by approving the 2018 internal audit plan. 14 audit projects have been proposed for the completion through the plan in 2018. Examples of programs and services participating in the plan include the region's procurement processes, planning and development services, grants and incentives program, risk assessments on the region's children's services and long-term care homes, as well as, as well as our water treatment plants. Dad, Mayor, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you for that very comprehensive report. Are there questions of Mr. Barrick this evening? No. Councilor Main, Councilor Butters. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councilor Barrick. I just want to uh, apologize to the person who uh, uh, manages the ambulance service. I made a comment a few weeks back about not having air ride in the ambulances, and it turns out that they do have air ride. So I apologize for that. So what my main concern now is maybe our roads need to be fixed. <laughs> so just wanted to, you could pass that on if you don't mind. Thank you, Mr. Maine. Thank you, Mr. If I may respond. Thanks, uh, Councillor Maine. I appreciate that. I'll pass, I'll pass along the first part for sure. The second part, if you can allude to the route you took so we can identify which ones were city roads and which ones are regional roads, definitely that might help. Oh, okay. All right. If you pass along which ones, uh, I'm happy to forward those on. Councillor Butters. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this may be a question for, for both of you, whoever wants to jump in. I think um, Facebook and, and social media was like blowing up from uh, last Thursday's meeting at the region where um, there was an alleged incident of a recording in an in-camera session, which we all know is a big, big, big no-no. Not allowed to do that. But the actions taken after that discovery were very disturbing. 
um, certainly to me and I think others. I think it's always good to, to learn from these situations and I and I wonder if our own staff is like prepared for that kind of a situation and I would certainly hope, you know, police wouldn't be called and things seized, but um, I wonder if from your own perspective, now you've had like some days to think think about it. I mean, it had to been a bit of a jolt to um, those present. Um, you know, what would you have done differently, if anything? Um, what's your thoughts on it going forward? Thank you. Councilor Barrett. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilor Butters, for the question. I was called by the media as well, and I, and I responded, and I think I was quoted in the paper as well with some commentary. Um, so although the session was in camera, I don't mind speaking to some of the, the incident that you spoke of because really that wasn't related to the discussion that we had in camera. Um, I can speak to it firsthand because I witnessed a, uh, a um, recording device operating hidden under a hat on the media desk. And uh, so it was identified not by me, although I did witness it being uncovered. And certainly, as you know here, the sensitivities when you're speaking about identifiable individuals and you're speaking with uh, legal and HR, et cetera. And so to your point, I think you used the word jolt. It was. And uh, immediately, um, uh, council ceased the discussion. And uh, staff uh, called in the security from the hall, brought it in, and asked that the equipment be removed. Subsequent to that, because we had a relatively full chamber, there was plenty of coats in the gallery. There was still on the media desk uh, additional uh, laptop and equipment that was up and running. And there was a lack of comfort now and a lack of confidence because of that, I would say, a breach of trust uh, by us going in camera and letting people, you know, if we're letting people keep stuff in the room. Um, so that um, several counselors said, look, there's still equipment operating. Again, zero comfort level. Staff had asked, remove the equipment, and the equipment was removed. Council resumed its discussions, having no knowledge of what was occurring out in the hallway until afterwards. And I know subsequent to that, the region apologized to Mr. Sachak in particular. I would state that the issue with uh, Mr. Haskell is still ongoing. Uh, the CAO apologized to Mr. Sachak, and I believe the chair apologized to uh, Mr. Sachak for that. Moving forward, uh, it's clear, and you referenced it here. I don't know what your protocol is if that was to occur here, right? So the region is going to come up with some protocols uh, in consultation with the media, in fact, uh, with legal, uh, with HR, and others. Um, so hopefully that'll address kind of moving forward. It wasn't an unfortunate incident, and uh, I can assure you, though, no one counselor or council as a whole uh, made decision or direction to move ahead in that manner. Uh, we just wanted the equipment out so we could resume our meeting. And that's what that's what happened. I hope that helps. Thank you. Mr. Lloyd? Sure, through your worship to Councillor Butters, I can follow up on the half of your question that was directed to city staff. Uh, we haven't had discussions about this at the staff level, but I've been giving it a lot of thought since the incident was so widely publicized on Thursday. And while we like to think that our friends in the media wouldn't try any of that funny business. And I know that, for example, media members and their publishers belong to professional associations that have a code of conduct and standards that don't allow them to record meetings that they're not allowed to record or to break our procedural bylaw. But there's also the social media and there's, there's, there's people who do make, who aren't held to that standard because they're members of the public. But we do have one thing that the region doesn't have the luxury of having, which is a small council, and the ability to leave this room and go into the other room for a closed session. So I think I'll be working with our new clerk on making sure that our procedural bylaw addresses this well enough. But I think that by making sure that no one from the public gets a chance to put a recording device in our committee room is one thing. And if we ever, for any reason, had to have a meeting in this room that was closed or in camera, we would ask the media to take their belongings, to not leave their belongings behind for their protection and for our protection. So those are the ideas that we've had at the staff level here. I also spoke with an instructor from Niagara College, the journalism course, and they were very concerned about the, uh, the potential limitations on uh, their ability, freedom of, uh, of speech. And, but there are also, there are positive aspects of it that they will, uh, uh, perhaps have some protocols at their professional association level uh, to deal with situations of indiv individuals who would uh, uh, attempt to uh, record in-camera meetings of any sort. 
So it was an unfortunate situation that's being dealt with, and, uh, and we hope, that, again, there's no full explanation of uh, the smoking gun, so to speak, the uh, actual recording device, how it, in fact, got there, uh, and why it was left there. But uh, uh, as Mr. Barrick has elicited, uh, they moved on it very quickly and are very apologetic when blame was inferred uh, on an, indivi an individual who really uh, was not blameworthy at all. And Thank it's you a bystander. For your comments. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions of Mr. Barrick? There being none. Thank you, Mr. Barrick. Moving on to uh, the next agenda item, number 13. Are there any councillors' inquiries that they want to put forward? Councillor Bodner. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just like to uh, let council know that uh, a new street sign went up um, in Ward 4, um, correcting, I guess, a wrong that was done at some point. Uh, Vimy Road that runs from the Cedar Bay Road to Pinecrest Road um, was originally called Vimy Ridge Road in honor of the Battle of Vimy Ridge. Somehow, at some point, it got changed to Vimy Road. Um, a, uh, a Chip and Deb O'Shea brought this forward to Councillor Butters and myself and um, with some uh, evidence um, of history where it was uh, you know, recorded as Vimy Ridge Road. And they felt strongly that this being the 100th year anniversary of the Battle of Vimy Ridge, that it's only right that that, you know, should identify what it was originally meant to do, is honor that uh, Battle of Vimy Ridge. So, um, Councilor Butters and I simply turned it over to Chris and, uh, boom, a sign went up. Um, now that's, <laughs> that's a pretty quick turnaround and, and I appreciate that from staff and, and thank you, Mr. Lee, for doing that. Uh, I do have a question. Um, so now that the road has been, um, yeah, Vimy Ridge Road has been added, what happens to Vimy Road and all of the uh, fire department, ambulance, uh, police and everything that now all of a sudden there's a new road name? Can you let us know about that? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councilor Butters. Um, staff that was involved in the research and the determination of what the proper name of the road was uh, has also been involved in communications uh, with <clears throat> emergency staff. Um, I will be verifying that the chief has all the numbers and places and mapping changes that he needs over the next days. And uh, uh, I know that in talking with the staff uh, late this afternoon that they had uh, forwarded off an email to the uh, dispatch. So. They are aware of the new name. Uh, the situation that uh, puts a spin on this is that now that it's under its proper name, some of the homes and homeowners that live along that road uh, may notice that they now live on Vimy Ridge Road as opposed, or as opposed to Vimy Road. That's going to create some issues for them potentially in mailing addresses. Oh, I guess I would apologize to the people that may have to tweak their addresses and that. Um, and it can be kind of a pain in the butt, I think, because you have to do a number of banking and, and a bunch of different things. But I think to make this right was the right thing to do. Um, and, you know, I, I don't even know when it ever got changed to that, but maybe Chris has uh, some information in his uh, research. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councilor Biden. Um, there's actually bylaws on the books that states that being Vimy Ridge Road. So subsequently, over a period of time, time unknown as to when that happened, it was short formed incorrectly. And now we're back to the original, as Council had approved in the, in the original development and uh, accepting of those bylaws. Thanks for your quick action. I, I was almost surprised when I got an email saying, wow, there's a new sign, what's going on? It was like, you know, really quick. Thank you, Chris. It's a Christmas miracle. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Uh, Council, with your permission, I would like to 
return to discussion of uh, uh, items requiring separate discussion um, and then come back to uh, this item on the agenda item 13. Uh, if it's, uh, if that's a, is there a unanimity that we do that? Uh, okay, then we'll go to item number two. Uh, Mr. Main, that was uh, your item. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Engineering and Operations Engineering Division, report number 2017-188, subject information report, Steel Street and Elgin Street, four-way stop. Thank you. Is there a recommendation for that? Is there a seconder for that recommendation, Councillor Kenny? Discussion? Councillor Main? Yes, I, I just have uh, some brief concerns. Uh, our original inquiry was for a four-way stop. Uh, uh, and somehow this got to be uh, more than a four-way stop and uh, a crosswalk for pedestrians. Well, uh, I deal with uh, that area quite a bit. Uh, I have friends there and, uh, and I have a doctor there. Uh, the issue more or less isn't for a pedestrian crosswalk. It's more or less for a four-way stop sign so the people can get out of Elgin Street onto Steel Street. Uh, sometimes it's uh, depending on the time of day and the speed of uh, the people going from Kalali to Clarence or from Clarence to Kalali, uh, it's sometimes a long wait and very arduous for these people to pull out. Uh, that whole subdivision is one way in and one way out, which also complicates it a bit. And uh, as far as cost goes, wouldn't a four-way stop sign. I mean, we've got the posts and we've got the senior signs and we've got the electronic solar-powered flashing light as we speak. Uh, I, I kind of think that's probably what those seniors want. And uh, I'd be happy to, to hear uh, anybody else's concerns over that. Perhaps a comment from uh, Mr. Lee. To you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Councillor Main, uh, the reasoning for the four-way stop not being entertained is uh, as a, uh, there's a slight detailing of it in the report. But essentially, the study that was done and all the traffic counts that were taken uh, was the information that staff used to then determine that a four-way stop was not warranted based on all of the traffic volumes um, during the entire periods of the day that were done. The study was done uh, in the report. It stipulifies the, the year that it was. I can't recall right now. But uh, it was done by Associate Engineering, and they did a detailed study of the entire intersection with their traffic volumes, pedestrian flows, and their recommendation at the time was that a four-way stop is not warranted, and that's simply what staff has hung our hat on. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, to Mr. Lee. Uh, I think the report was done in 2007, was it not? And that's uh, 10 years ago, and there's one heck of a lot more houses there now, uh, a lot more people there. Uh, so I kind of think that's probably out of date. Uh, now, I, I get a lot of good comments over this four-way stop that the city put in on Sugarloaf and Elm. It works rather well. Uh, people there seem to be quite happy, and uh, a lot of them say it was long overdue, including the people that used the road. Uh, so my point would be, it's fairly simple to do. Uh, these people would like to have it, and uh, uh, I'm all for a four-way stop if that's possible. Any other comments? Councilor Kenny. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I know now why uh, Jim didn't show up tonight, because that was my Christmas present he was supposed to bring me. So I can see he hid. He'd be there anyway. Um, I... I want to tell you that I'm in full support of a four-way stop there. It needs to be done. You know, you, you quote um, in your report uh, uh, an intersection. This intersection was reviewed during 2003. 2003. That's like 14 years ago. And I certainly uh, I agree with um, Councillor Main 
the, the demographics have changed there. And I would hope, I would hope that this has come up several times, Council, and I would hope that they would uh, support a four-way stop. Any other comments on the issue, Councilor Bond or Councilor Lutz? Just because we're throwing dates around, on page 30, I think it says 2012 was that uh, report. When they looked at that Rosemount Estate uh, subdivision, Mr. Mayor, if I can, through you to either Dan or Chris, is, is that Rosemount Estates still going to affect that corner? What's the, the deal with that? Through Mr. Mayor to Councillor Bonner, the only thing I can comment on is that that development I have not heard a word of in quite some time. So the draft approval is going to be lapsing and that will be a decision if the application, the applicants want to move that forward. I just not, have not heard from them in quite some time. So, barring uh, Councillor Kenny not getting a great Christmas present, I've, I haven't been always in favor of four-way stops. I, I, and I, my doctor's down there too, and I know once in a while you come to that intersection and somebody's trying to make a left-hand turn, and it does take a while to, you know, to make that. Um, eventually, you get there, and it does, you know, traffic <coughs> clears, and you can make it. I, I don't know. I don't think I can. Uh, I can vote for this four-way stop sign at this time. Thanks. Councilor Doucet, Councilor Elliott. <laughs> Thank you. Um, bottom line is, I remember when the study was done, and there were discussions about when the study had been done, and it was done in the middle of the summer when there was less traffic because the school was out, and so on and so forth. Therefore, I don't know if the validity of this study really paid off and really gave us an accurate number. And, and I, would, I would request that um, staff go back to the study to check it out, because if for any reason, for any reason, it was done in the middle of the summer, the numbers are not valid for most of the year. They're only valid during the summer, which is two months. And, and I, I would tend to believe that those numbers would be very different if we studied it in uh, September, October, uh, and so on. Uh, so that's something that I think we need to go back and check before we take a good look at uh, what we're going to do with that corner because I, I believe that something has to be done. I bring my grandson in there almost every day to, 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 to high school, and I'll sit on that corner, and I can sit there for 10 minutes before I can move out of there. Uh, so, you know, and that's coming out of the high school area, and a lot of the seniors coming out just sit and sit, and much longer than we do, because they're not sure and they're driving and they're being much more cautious than we usually are. And I've seen, I've seen one sit there for almost 20 minutes before he, he would turn. Um, so I think we need to go back and take a good look at when the study was done. And if we need another study, then maybe we should have one that is done at the appropriate time. That probably would be more valid than the one we have now. If it was done at the appropriate time, then the numbers are the numbers, and then we do we, we decide from there. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Elliott. Then Mr. Demery. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I can't support a four-way stop for a couple of reasons. Um, at some point in time, we have to adopt standards that we're going to stand by, and there is a standard for the number of vehicles that that go up and down a street in order to put a stop sign in. And while it may get busy when school's in, and some of the seniors may have a tough time getting out, the length of time that it takes you to get out of there is, is I'm gonna say a lot of it is mental. You think it takes longer than it actually does. The problem I have is that 
there isn't a lot of people coming out of Portal Village at one time. So if it takes you two minutes or two and a half minutes to get out onto the street, you're not causing a backup. My issue is that if you stop up Steel Street, north and south, which is a major artery coming into the city, coming into downtown, when people don't see anybody sitting at the cross street waiting to come out, it's gonna be a slow and go. Because you're gonna have people queued up 15, 20 cars deep waiting to get through the intersection when there's nobody waiting on the cross side. You're gonna have all your school people gone by 8, 10 in the morning. Mm -hmm. But the traffic on Steel Street continues throughout the day, which you are forcing to stop for no reason other than a couple of cars coming, which there is ample time. I live around the corner. I go past there every single day. And I've never seen anybody queued up on Elgin Street waiting to come out, never. So to say that they sit there five minutes, 10 minutes, it may seem like a long time, but truthfully, it's not. So you're gonna stop up a major artery coming into the city for what reason? Right? Now what you do is make the intersection more dangerous because now those people going north and south on steel don't come to a complete stop. Now you bring pedestrian crossing into the equation because now it's more dangerous for people to cross the street on foot because not everybody's coming to a complete stop. That's identified in this report and in item one when we talked about the crossing on Clarence Street. If you put stop signs in, it doesn't mean that pedestrians are protected. It doesn't mean that people driving cars are protected. There has to be a warrant for the stop sign. This is not warranted. It makes it more dangerous. And you're gonna stop up a street where trucks come in, buses come down, a lot of traffic come in. Um, it, it, it's, it's not the place to put a stop sign in mid-corridor like that. I, I, I can't support that. If, if we want to look at a pedestrian crossing that makes it safer for pedestrians to get across the road, I could support that. But I, 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 can't, I cannot support putting a stop sign in, in that location. Councilor Demery. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, um, I have a, a couple of points of view on this. Um, first of all, coming from the active transportation perspective again and, and being the council representative there, uh, this is something that has been discussed by that committee. They fully support a pedestrian crosswalk going in there. Um, it is, you know, they, they're looking at pedestrian safety and active transportation, so of course that would make sense. That's what they're doing. Now, being a driver and having made that left-hand turn from Steel onto Elgin and then again from Elgin onto Steel. Those left hand turns are sometimes a bit of a pain and there is definitely a wait time. Um, the right hand turns, it's, they're not issues, it's the left hand turns. Um, and I, I don't find that a particular problem, but I know some people do. So for that, I, I get it. I understand why there might be a call for a four-way stop. I don't know that that's, that's going to be the answer, though. I think no matter what, we need to go through. We need to go forward with the pedestrian cross, crosswalk. That's what we need to do. Um, the argument about provincial warrants, I don't know if that even holds up anymore because we did do the Sugarloaf uh, uh, cross, uh, stop sign, rather, and that certainly wasn't a warranted cross, stop sign. So um, I don't know that we can do that. But I would definitely not want to see this put on a shelf while we wait for yet another study. We need a pedestrian crosswalk at the very least in, in, on that uh, intersection. So that, that's what I'm asking for, is to get that out there. Thank you. Just for clarification, Mr. Lee, uh, do we have that pedestrian crosswalk now? Or there's a flashing light there. What, what is that, sir? To you, Mr. Mayor, there's currently a crosswalk indicated, but it doesn't have the new signage nor the new flashing lights of that nature. It's just simply delineating, uh, much like a regular crosswalk would be with uh, what's commonly known in the industry as the piano keys and a warning that there's crossing ahead with pedestrians. Any further discussion on this item? We have Mr. Bodner. Thank you. I, I want to pick up on something that Councillor Main said. I, I don't think the original ask was for a, a pedestrian crosswalk. Was it not? Is there? Yeah. Yeah. And so 
I know staff has come up with this crosswalk, but is it is it needed? I I'm there a lot. It's like so people are crossing to go over to the high school side. Um, if they're going, sorry, but if they're going someplace like downtown, would they not be better to walk to the stoplight at Clarence and then go down there? I don't know. You know what are we? What are we doing? Just putting a crosswalk in to save? They're going to walk a block one way or the other. So I don't know. I, I don't think I'd be for that either. That's uh, that might be money not well spent. Thanks. Any further discussion? Is there any desire to refer this back by anyone? Mrs. Main is not a support, or Mrs. Demery does not want to support that suggestion. Mr. Main, were you going to, you had your hand up there. Well, to me, this is very confusing because what we asked for was a forward stop. <coughs> uh, and now we're looking at a crosswalk. And the only way crosswalk would work for me at the corner, I'd have to jump out of my car, push the button, jump in the car, and make my turn. Uh, it's uh, it's a can of worms. It's, uh, I can see everybody's point, but uh, and you know, slowing traffic down. Like I said before, depending on what sign you look at in Port Colburn, I don't really think it's that much of an issue to have to slow traffic down. We have two schools that two school zones there, and they're already uh, 40 kilometers an hour. So uh, I don't think that that's much of a problem. I can't support this as a crosswalk, but uh, I would make a recommendation that we go to a four-way stop and vote on it. Whether we have to defer it to the next council meeting, uh, I don't know. What are your issues? What can we do? I think. Can I just give him one second? Certainly, can we? So through your worship to Councillor Main and a few others, the point was made, if we wanted a four-way stop, why did staff come back with a report on the <clears throat> crosswalk? I think that's specifically in reference to the 2007 and 2010 motions that are referenced on page 29 and 30. Um, I have to defend staff on this. If you want a particular recommendation, don't ask staff for a, an opinion, because th if the opinion doesn't match the recommendation, we run into a conflict between staff and council, right? I remember another municipality that uh, where the council member threw the report and said, this wasn't the recommendation we asked for. <laughs> well, so it becomes problematic. That wasn't in Port Colburn. It becomes problematic when we want to presuppose the outcome. Now, it does appear that the staff member made a mental leap from solving the problem of traffic entering and exiting Elg Elgin um, in a four-way stop to help with that to pedestrians so that does seem like that was a mental leap and i understand council's position so i think it's a matter of what problem council's trying to address is it the drivers is it the walkers or is it both and then getting the right solution for council and that would be up to you what the solution is well we have the recommendation moved and seconded uh, mr bonner you have one final comment well, I would just say, if, if no one's comfortable with this, I would hope that we would just turn this down. And if somebody wants to make some other recommendation, then, you know, that's fine, but let's not spend money fixing a problem that may not be a problem. And just to Mr. Louie's um, comment about maybe staff being gun-shy, I hope staff would tell us right out you guys are nuts and you don't need this. That's that's what I want to hear from staff. They're the experts. Um, then if if council so decides, then, you know, they can override it. But I would never want staff to feel that they had to bring a report back that might um, anger a few councillors. Tough, you know? I would encourage staff to bring that back. Right is right. So... Just a thought. Mr. Lee. To you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Bodner. Um, actually, if you go through each step of the report, 
uh, staff has actually addressed. And at this point in time, if we were to go back and reassess the Fort Wayne stop, we would not change our opinion because it's based on the best information we have today. As we've stated in the report, we do not recommend a Fort Wayne stop. That being said, that's our recommendation. What council chooses to do or not do is strictly up to them. Thank you. As said, we have a recommendation moved and seconded. It's time to have a vote. <coughs> uh, council directs staff to implement option number two, budget for the installation of a level two, level two pedestrian crossover, $30,000 during the 2018 budget deliberations for the intersection of Steel Street and Elgin Street. That's the, what we're voting on. Is that understood? All those in favor? All those opposed? Motion defeated. <coughs> Recommendation defeated. Okay. I think we can now go back to the formal agenda. <coughs> An additional recommendation? points out that uh, there has been no directions of staff. Uh, is there any further recommendation that council would want to make to staff on this issue? There would appear that there is none. So the issue dies. Returning to the uh, agenda, we have councilors issues. Continued, Councilor Dash. I guess we might have voted Chris there. Uh, I just want to thank him for getting that street light fixed on Main Street. It took a whopping seven months to get three lights working. I know if it was at my house, it would have been fixed a lot quicker. That one on Main that was involved with that accident, I think that took a little bit longer than necessary. Uh, a lot of beating around the bush there getting that done. Um, that's one. I guess that's an opinion. The second one is, uh, since we're on the stop sign issue there, I had uh, brought up about eight weeks ago about uh, Knoll and Highland there, if we could possibly look at uh, that intersection there. A lot of kids go down that street towards uh, the school there. I just wonder if we got any uh, anything coming back on that at this time. To you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Dench. Uh, yes, that's actually on staff's desk right now, and that should be um, in the next council meeting which I'm told now is January the 22nd. Thank you. That's it. Any other comments uh, by staff? Go ahead, Angie. No, I, I, I had some items. Good night. No comments. Just okay. items by counselor's items to me? Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, okay, I have a couple of items. Uh, first, I, this would be through you, Mr. Mayor, to Chris. Um, I got a call from a, a gentleman who was concerned about the the corner of Elm and Clarence, the northeast corner by 7-Eleven there. He says that there's a, a, a pole that had been used for something that had been sheared off, but it's been sheared off too high from the ground. It's actually got a few uh, a few inches of uh, above the ground, and he says it's a major trip hazard. So if somebody could get out there and look at it and maybe take it down to ground level, that would be a, a good thing. It's, it's northeast corner. Okay. Um, now the other one, the other item I had um, has to do with an email I sent you today, Chris. This is about the East Village construction and uh, questions that I just wanted to make sure that we had, that all of us have the same answer on because other councillors are also getting calls. I mean, my phone's been lighting up, my email has been lighting up. It's uh, people are getting really, really antsy now that the uh, snow is falling and the ground is freezing and uh, they want to know what's going on. So I'm asking you to please outline how and when the sidewalks, road surfaces, and open trenches will be dealt with, how snow and ice removal will happen, um, and how the uh, walking surfaces will be made safe and level. To you, Mr. Mayor, to Councilor Demaray, and actually the rest of Council, uh, I'll give you a brief update on the project as it stands today. The uh, entire storm sewer system underground has been completed except for the Rodney outlet. The nickel outlet is functioning. As designed, the Rodney outlet uh, should be completed by the end of the year. That's the target at this work. 
Uh, that being said, um, there's been a flurry of activity within the last um, week and a half to two weeks. The concrete reinstatement crews, um, actually this week there are two reinstatement crews on site. There are two paving crews on site as we speak this week. Um, they were in on Friday and then they were in again uh, today. Uh, they are restoring the trenches so that the roads will be uh, much smoother and easier to plow. That being said, once those roads have been reinstated, we're hoping that they'll be finalized before the end of this week. Um, then city crews will be able to plow the roads as normal. Up until that point in time, it's the contractor's responsibility to make certain that the roads are plowed as part of his contract until he has completed his work. Okay, thank you. And, and that, as far as safe and level walk, uh, sidewalks, because uh, some of the sidewalks that were slated to be repaired are not able to be done because this construction sort of got in the way. And I'm thinking particularly there's a southern part of um, Mitchell Street just north of Nickel. There's uh, on the east side of that, there, there's one sidewalk there that is really terrible. I sent you several pictures. Um, and Steve, uh, yeah, quite a few through there. How are we going to deal with that through the winter? Because then it becomes really, really difficult to, you, you couldn't use that sidewalk at all because it's shifted and, and it's gone off to a side as well. So it's, it's a real mess. Through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Demery. Uh, yes, that's, uh, staff has looked at that. Uh, like I said before, the uh, contractor is repairing all of the works that were damaged as part of the construction. And any other um, concrete works that haven't been damaged but are in need of repair, there'll be um, the temporary repairs, either grinding or a removal with, uh, and then replacement with a cold mix for the winter. But we have to remove those trips. Hopefully the weather will stick with us and we can get it done quickly. Okay, I thank you. I hope so. That, that one in, in particular has a tree that has to come down t in order to do it as well. So that's a challenge for that one. But thank you very much for that answer. And I just, I just wanted to finish by wishing everyone a very Merry Christmas and uh, hoping to see everybody out at the Valley Center on uh, New Year's Eve to celebrate the next wonderful year coming through. Thank you. Any further councillor items? <coughs> Mr. Main. I think Mr. Elliott is first. Good to see Mr. Elliott. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, through you to Chris, because everybody's picking on you tonight. Um, just real quick, the uh, the new intersection <coughs> at uh, Clarence and Cement Road, is it on our radar next year at all to uh, kind of realign it? And I know that before Clarence came out, uh, the road had that bend in it, and now it, it doesn't really line up, and it's kind of still the curve is there and when you come to a stop you can't really see around the corners are we going to do anything with that uh, with that intersection before the bill that's underway now gets finalized and they open up the new section because it seems like there's going to be more traffic going in there so you mr mayor to councillor elliott um as you recall um, that four-way or that three-way stop was initiated just as a safety feature and the onset so that we could then have a chance to study the traffic flows uh, that's still going to be done once the subdivision develops, and then we will come back with a report later recommending a through street or continue with the three-way stop or whatever it may be. Um, the thought process was that if there was any alterations, it would be done at that time as opposed to doing something prematurely. Okay, so we're just, just a quick follow-up. So we're going to wait until kind of like the first phase is, I'll say, more complete than it is now and wait till phase two gets underway because I know I, I, I believe that they're going to start into phase two so you want to wait till we get a little bit more traffic in there just to see how it plays out three more less your mayor to Councilor Elliott that's correct okay uh, Mr. Main you had another point thank you Mr. Mayor through to uh, to Mr. Lee uh, how are we making out with uh, 109 steel 80 Elgin uh, 79 Michael Drive and a few others are, are we still uh, waiting for a contractor to repair any of this uh, concerns? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Main. Uh, the concrete repair, repair contractor is actually in town this week, and those are on the top of his list. Okay. And 109 Steel, he still has the big hole in his lawn? Those reinstatements are all part of his. Uh, okay. okay. He's even bringing in a separate asphalt crew to keep things going along with a, a third party. So. We've asked him to expedite those as quickly as possible. Thank you so much. Councilor Butters. 
Oh, <laughs> sorry, Mr. May. Okay, these will be these will be quick. Uh, through Mr. Mayor to Mr. Louis, uh, I just thought of this uh, today. Does Port Coburn have a designated grant writer in our staff mm -hmm. who uh, looks after writing grants and making sure they were on board? Sure. Through your worship to Councillor Main, we do not have a dedicated grant writer on board as of yet. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, up until now, each department has been responsible for writing their own grants or, uh, you know, some admin staff have picked up the responsibility of getting numerous departments to complete an application. We did recently, for the first time to my knowledge, use the services of a professional grant writer for a fee. That went pretty well, but we, the grant's not announced yet, so we don't know if we were successful or not. But um, the restructuring uh, proposal that was approved by Council in September actually included the appro approval of a marketing and communication specialist for the city, and the consultants said that a component of that position should be grant writing. So we did post that position internally. We have not awarded it yet, so we're going through an internal recruitment to find a person. If the person doesn't have expertise who is eventually in the position, we're going to have to get them some training and rely on them as our grant writer. There will still be a component of every grant that comes from the department that's doing the project. For example, if it's uh, a road or a bridge, we need the technical information to come from the engineering department because the grant writer wouldn't have the technical expertise. But in, uh, we do have plans for the communications person to have full responsibility or coordinating responsibility for writing grants. Thank you, Mr. Louis. Uh, I have one more, uh, Mr. Mayor, and then I'll shut my mic off. Uh, through, uh, I don't know who's, anybody can answer this, but uh, our hydro situation. Now, I know that it's very sporadic, just as soon as it gets over 50 kilometers an hour. Uh, and I heard today uh, that it, the problem has been solved and it's repaired, but I also have a lot of friends that live in Fort Erie, and they have exactly the same problems we have in Fort Erie. Uh, is it this company just doesn't do due diligence when it comes to preventative maintenance or is it one of these deals where the infrastructure's got to the point where they have to patch it to get it going? Could anybody answer that one? Mr. Lee, can you respond to that? I hate to swim in another man's pond, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's been our uh, experience that... Uh, they have a capital component that they do on an annual basis. It's based on their revenues. Um, you are correct in that the infrastructure is not new, but that doesn't mean that it can't be maintained. Uh, other than that, I can't comment on specifically why, when, and where, but uh, I think that uh, we would have to dig deeper with the actual um, owners of the company, CNP in particular. Perhaps we could ask uh, the hydro generator to come uh forward to a future council meeting to say, oh, you had a comment? Sure. sure. Through your worship, I was just going to say that um, there was a rather long power outage at uh, the end of last year or the start of this year, and it caused quite an amount of concern in the community. And the mayor and I did we'd meet with three officials from Canadian Niagara Power in the mayor's office and sort of brought forward the concerns of a lot of residents because there was speculation um, among the community that, that, that the reason was diminished inf infrastructure investment. Um, but they laid out their budget, they laid out their plans, and they laid out their mapping in front of the mayor and I. And they assert that they do quite a bit of preventative maintenance or preventive maintenance where they're targeting specific areas and upgrading the, upgrading the infrastructure there. They also do a lot of tree trimming and with the ash trees and, uh, and other issues where trees get in too close to wires and wind can take dead tree branches and, and sort of affect, affect the wires, and then how responsive they can be. They claim that the long outage was, um, this is Canadian Niagara Power now, claims that the long outage was re related to Hydro One's feed into the city, and that it affected uh, as many people as it did for as long as it did, because it was how fast Hydro One could get a repair done. So that two-tiered uh, supply chain is part of the problem. But I think maybe one of the one things, so to the mayor's point, we can, maybe make overtures to Fortis's staff and see if they can send somebody out here with a better explanation at a future council meeting. Thanks. 
On this issue, Madam Memory, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, through you, I guess to our CAO, I, I know that there is a planned power outage for the morning of December 16th. Is, is that um, in any way in, uh, involved but with them doing work on the lines, or is that for some other reason? Sure. For your worship to Councillor Demery, it is actually a separate issue altogether. There is a piece of machinery that's been fabricated in Port Colborne that's being shipped out of Port Colborne on the canal. So it's leaving Inverto's Drive, and, and I think the size of the equipment means that certain hydro lines have to come off or, or be depowered, de-energized in order to transport the machine or piece of equipment to the canal, get it on board a vessel, and it's gonna be shipped out of Port Colborne. So it is approximately four hours in maximum length, estimated length, but they're hoping that they can mitigate that time a little bit by having a rolling uh, outage. So as they proceed through an area, they can re-energize the area that they've passed through. So that's on Saturday. Morning. Saturday morning, 8 a.m. on Saturday, December 16th. Thank you. No. Councillor Butters. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I was wondering if you had had a chance to check with the region um, regarding those watershed jobs that have moved from the MPCA to the region and under what kind of um, lens they will look through when they're doing that job, whether it'll be like um, a conservation lens or a more of a pro-development lens. And I wondered if you'd had a chance to get anything, uh, any information on that for me. No, I don't have any information on whether uh, it's a pro-development or pro-conservation uh, lens that we're looking through. That will be a decision that will come from the region <coughs> itself, uh, Mr. Tripp, most likely, or perhaps the uh, CAO. Uh, we don't have that information yet. Again, uh, the, the point on some of the individuals have been rehired. Others are going to be hired by the region. There may be uh, one or two that uh, may be permanently displaced, but until the new assessment of what they're going to be doing is completed, uh, there won't, uh, I can't give you a response to it. Okay, I'll just keep on checking in. Fine. Again, as I said, I think there was one problem that uh, we were dealing with two different unions and that they're having a problem amongst themselves as to what, uh, who's going to be hired where. But uh, that, that's just one of several complicating factors. Uh, any other points, uh, Mr. Bodner? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I wonder... Uh, I had asked for item 19 to be pulled, and I didn't realize that we hadn't uh, spoke on that, and we just moved along. And I know it's just to be received for information, but I wonder if council's indulgent, we might be able to revisit that. Um, yeah, it was number 19. Oh, we haven't dealt with it yet. Sorry. Oh, that's right, because we dealt with one and then we went back. Okay. We can record. All right. Just don't miss it then, Mr. Mayor, when you come to it, okay? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, because I did three and 11, that's why. Okay. Okay, if I'm looking at this, uh, item number 16, Mr. Elliott. Thank you, Mayor. Niagara Region Re Regional Council approval of audit committee recommendation respecting the town of Pelham. Seconder for the recommendation. Councilor Doucet. Discussion? Yeah. <coughs> Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm going to go off our normal way of receiving uh, forms from uh, different municipalities. I have an issue with this. An absolute major issue. And at times, it's in disbelief I read this, and it angers me, and it's not what Niagara's supposed to be about. There's always been a, there's always been a one Niagara nest proposed for everybody, everybody to work together for the common good of the region. 
And in my opinion, this is the region bullying one of the municipalities. Number one says that Niagara Region expressed concern, highlighted expressed concern that the town of Pelham has not advised the Niagara Region of potential material change in the town's financial position. That's an opinion of somebody. Two, that the Niagara Region notify relevant lenders that there may be a material change in the town of Pelham's financial position. Again, that's an opinion of some people, and I find it unbelievable that the region of Niagara would contact relevant lenders and say that one of the municipalities in the region of Niagara may have a material change in their finances? Do they not realize that there's political oversight of all of the municipalities? Number three, the Niagara Region requests the Town of Pelham share the summer 2017 KPMG audit and allow regional audit staff to discuss the audit report with KPMG directly. Who do they think they are? The municipalities do not answer to the region. That's their audit. They don't have to disclose that or give that to anybody. Four, that regional staff prepare a report outlining options to strengthen regional review and approval of local area and municipal debenture requests. That includes us. If we want to do anything, we have to put out a debenture that has to be approved by the region. What are they going to look at? We're governed by a couple of guidelines, a 20% repayment that's self-imposed and a 25% repayment limit that's imposed by the province. If we are within those two guidelines, who are they to say that we can't have a debenture? I, I, that, that just... That's not part of their job. That's not their job. That number five, that Niagara Region defer consideration of any future bylaws pertaining to additional tell of town of Pelham debt until such time that the summer 2017 KPMG audit and other relevant material is shared and reviewed with regional audit staff. Again, that's not their job. If anybody is gonna review Pelham's debt and their finances, it will be the province. Six, that this resolution be circulated to Niagara, Niagara's local area municipalities, Niagara MPPs, and the Ontario Ombudsman and an Auditor General. Great, I can live with that. Seven, that the town of Pelham be requested to hold a public meeting with two weeks notice prior to any decision to divest land. Where does the region think that they have any part of a municipality wanting to sell land? Zero. They can't tell us when to sell land, how to sell land, and what to do with anything that we own. Somebody show me, and I will stand up and say I was 100% wrong that that is stated in the Municipal Act that the region can tell them and have tell us to hold a public meeting within two weeks if we're going to sell land. I'll wait for the reply for anybody out there that wants to give me a reply that says the Municipal Act states that. So I don't know if we can just say that no, we're not going to receive the letter because it just says receive it. Or we can turn it around and send it back to the region and say, you know what, I don't, I don't agree with any of this. None. You're overstepping your, your boundaries. Overstepping that. And, and in this day and age when we're supposed to be working together for the betterment of all of Niagara and they send something out like this, I would say I'm disgusted, but that doesn't go to the full extent of how I feel. Everybody says everybody was working so hard on the go file to get go to come to town. Everybody said how well the region worked when they landed GE to come and build up in Welland. Everybody worked together. And then the region turns around and does this to a municipality. I'll be open for suggestions on what council wants to do, but I can't. I can't receive this without comment, and I'm not sure what else we can do. But I, 
I don't want to receive it, so I'll, I'll throw it out there. Councilman Doucette, Councilman Butters, Council Lady, Council Lady Butters, Council Lady Demary, and Councilman uh, Maine. Go ahead, Mr. Thank Mr. you very much, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> I totally agree with everything that Councillor Elliott just indicated. My other concern with this is that by sending it, sending this out that way, it's a shot on everyone's bow. Watch it, we're coming, we're gonna be watching you guys, and we're in charge. That's what this says, and that's not their job. The only reason we have to go through them for a debenture is that's the way the structure is set up. And I can ask Mr. Sinez maybe if he can tell me, am I wrong in that that's the way the structure is set up? We have no choice but to do it that way. They don't have a choice whether they, can, uh, they, they allow it or not. We just have to go through them. We have no choice. So Mr. Sinez, can you please explain this to me through Mr. Mayor? Yep, through you, Mr. Mayor, Councillor Doucette. Uh, you're correct, it's the yeah, Municipal Act that uh, dictates how uh, the lower tier municipalities are to borrow or debenture. And we have to go through the region uh, for that, and the region borrows on our behalf, and then we pay back the region and, and so on. So if, from their perspective, it's, it's their debt, but we are the ones that are paying the debt overall, and, um, and we don't have any issues with, uh, with the, on the approval of this council of uh, the debt that we can repay our debt and provide it to, uh, the, through the region back to the uh, local uh, lending companies. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Mr. Sinez. Like I said, I believe this is a shot on, some, uh, on all the lower tier municipalities. It simply says, do what we tell you or we're not gonna get you the money. We're not gonna let you have what, you're, what you ask for and you guys are supposed to do what we tell you to do, not what you wanna do. And that's not their job. That's not their job and this is what this says. Number six, I can agree to that. That's not a problem. It's all these other things that are, that are literally trying to tell a community that you cannot do what we want you to do. And number seven really concerns me in that if we decided we wanted to divest in some land, we've got to do this. They're gonna come, if this gets through and this happens, they're gonna be doing this with every community. And then what do we do? It means we'll say that we are now one, one regional town because that's what, that, that's what this is aiming for. And I disagree with it and I think it needs to be thrown back in their face. And just simply not accepting it is not enough. I think we need to send it back to them, telling them this is not allowed, this is not your job. And I think we need to use those words to tell them that we think they're wrong. We need to tell them. Thank you, Mr. Sussat. Councillor Butters. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, first of all, I do agree with my fellow councillors, Elliot and Doucette. Um, I would add that I'm not sure if this is a, a culmination or an ongoing of a witch hunt on the town of Pelham and their mayor and council. Um, I think that for what I've just observed over the last few months, it would seem that um, it's a very targeted uh, bullying tactic that I, for one, am bloody sick and tired of. And I agree totally that a letter needs to go out um, stating our fierce objection uh, to this, to this uh, recommendation from the audit committee and, and um, what, what the Niagara region is proposing here for Pelham. I think it's just, uh, I, I have to kind of wonder, you know, bad things can continue to happen when really good people sit back and do nothing. And I'm not prepared to do nothing. I don't think the people around this horseshoe are prepared to do nothing. This is wrong. And we need to stand up and uh, be counted in that way and let them know that they are way out of line and they better get themselves pulled into line um, if they're smart, which I'm not even too sure of that anymore, with some of them up there, because um, there's an election coming in 2018, and I think more and more people are paying attention to, to the, I'll call them antics. I mean, this is just, just, just a, another one in a long list of things that 
I shake my head and, and think to myself, like, what are you, what are you doing? What are you doing? It's just, it's just to me, bizarre. Thank you for your Thank time. Thank you, Mr. Butters, Pat Devery. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, through you. First of all, I, I thank my fellow councillors for uh, saying what they've said and, and taking such a strong stand, and uh, for Councillor Elliot, Elliot for putting it so eloquently. I uh, couldn't have been quite so eloquent, eloquent. When I read this, I thought, did I wake up in Oz? This is insane. And, and literally, that's how it felt. I, I could not believe it. I have no interest in being part of the greater municipality of Niagara either. Um, this is Port Colborne. This puts me on notice that this could happen here too. There's absolutely no way I can support this and I would like to know from the clerk what mechanism we could use to make sure that we not only um, don't receive this information because I have no interest in having this information, but that we send a letter uh, in strong opposition to the um, stand taken by the region. Could I ask uh, that's what I'm asking the to uh, comment but, uh, yeah. uh, after uh, Mr. Main? Okay, that's good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'll make this short so I, I'd like to hear what the clerk has to say. But I agree with all these other councillors. The people who should be concerned about the town of Pelham are the town of Pelham taxpayers. Yes. This is their issue. Really, it shouldn't be a regional issue. Uh, if they're run out of money, they have to borrow money from somebody else, that's their problem. Uh, but the part that bothers me the most is, sure, this is the, the audit committee's recommendation, but what it just tells us is regional council at its meeting held November the 16th, 2017, approved it. So uh, the mindset to me is uh, there's a lot of people, well, a lot of the councillors, and, uh, and I know you're a councillor as well, Mr. Mayor, uh, approved this. So that's the part that bothers me the most. Uh, uh, is Basically, it's the town of Pelham. It's their issue. Their taxpayers are going to have to pay it if they have to, however that works. Uh, and I don't want to see that happen in Port Colborne. Uh, and it could ha easily happen here with an audit committee from the region saying that Port Colborne's out of hand and all the regional councillors voted for it. Uh, so I, I support the rest of our council. Thank Madam, you, Mr. Mayor. Madam Clerk, do you have a, a comment on how you have the feeling of council, uh, how you would like to uh, suggest that this uh, resolution be ordered? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, council has the option to pass a motion that says that it's in uh, strong opposition to the resolution passed by the region. And um, as part of that motion, you could also um, instruct the, my, the clerk's office to uh, return the correspondence to the region of Niagara, if that's what you so wish. Mr. Elliott, do you want to? Thank you, Mayor. Yes, I would, I would uh, fully support that, that uh, we attach our comments and return the letter, and also that uh, it gets distributed to uh, all the local er all area the municipalities. Yeah, yeah that, uh, that they included too. And everybody, the Auditor General, Ombudsman, yes. Cindy Forster, Wayne Gates, Jim Bradley, Sam Osterhoof, Osterhoff, Oosterhoff? I guess that's how you say it, and all the local area municipalities. Um, the, and I'm not exactly sure how close the vote was in, in all of, in regional council at committee, or in council. I would be surprised if all 12 mayors supported this. Um, I would that would that would that would shock me if, if there was support from the mayors, um, just because. Are you making the recommendation or continuing the discussion? Yeah, no, I'm making a recommendation, and I just followed up with a comment that I would be surprised if it was supported by the 12 mayors. And is there a seconder for that recommendation, Councillor Demery? Yeah. Are ready to vote on what we would call amendment to the main motion? All those in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Okay, item number 17, Madam Demery. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mayor Mike Bradley, City of Sarnia, read letter to Catherine McKenna, Minister of Environment and Climate Change, re Ontario Power Generation's proposed deep geologic repository. Seconder for the recommendation. 
Councilor Gusset. Discussion? Madam Demery. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I read through I, I read through the letter coming from uh, Mayor Mike Bradley, and the uh, he referenced the number of. Let me just get this back up here to properly properly speak to it. Um, as he says here, signatories to this letter, all duly elected officials of the Great Lakes communities that have passed resolutions remain deeply opposed and united in opposition to the permanent burial of nuclear waste anywhere in the Great Lakes Basin. And we fully support Stop the Great Lakes Nuclear Dump in their work to protect the fresh water of the Great Lakes from the threat posed by OPG's proposed DGR. So and that's, uh, that basically to me says it all. Uh, if you go back and read the letter and um, it's, laid out in, in far more detail, but that one paragraph really says it all. And considering we are a city on the Great Lakes, um, we definitely need to protect protect our watershed and, and protect our waters. So um, I am asking that we not just receive this information, but that we fully support this. Thank you. Any other comments? Being done, call for the vote. Call for the vote. Oh. It's, it's an amendment? It's actually a change of amendment. Okay. Also, does that? Are you seconding? Yes. Amendment? And yes. You wanted to speak. And, and just a comment that if we change, if we make it, create a, an amendment like we just did, okay, do we defeat this and then put it in, or do we just say, let's amend it and do it? Uh, which one would be best um, through you, sir, to Madam Clerk? Madam Clerk? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. If it's a friendly amendment, um, you can simply you can simply Just accept it and then take the vote. Uh, okay. If it's not, then you would vote on the amendment and then okay. the main motion as a whole. Uh, the motion would simply be that it, it would be supported. That that was what the amendment would be. Do you, sir? Councilor, is that? Uh, just one more comment. Should we not let other people know that we're supporting it? So it should, does that need to be part of the recommendation or does, so uh, through you, sir, to Madam Clerk. Madam Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, as part of the follow-up of every um, council meeting, the clerk's office sends out correspondence uh, as routine uh, okay. on these types of matters. As long as we don't, we've done that. Are we ready to vote on the friendly amendment? All those in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Thank you. Thank you. Item number 18, Council Demaray, that is also yours. Thank you again, Mr. Mayor. Town of Fort Erie, re health care services in the Niagara region. Is there a seconder for the recommendation? Councilor Butters, is that your hand up for second hand? Discussion? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I have read through this as well, and I would really like to have this, uh, this whole resolution sent to our Port Colburn Medical Education Recruitment and Health Services Committee uh, for their comment. I think this is a place where I, I would really like to see what the people at that table have to say uh, with regards to this. Fine. Any other comments? Is that a motion for referral? Is that a motion for a referral, Adam? Yes, it Demery. is. Sorry. I'm sorry. Yes, it is. Is there a secondary for that motion to refer? Councilor Rodgers? Any further discussion? We think all the, for the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Item number 19. Mr. Bonner? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Ralph Goodell, Minister of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness, reads City of Port Coburn's resolution regarding medical marijuana grow operations. Seconder for the recommendation. Councillor Butter. Discussion. Mr. Bonner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Here's 
Here's another off the shelf letter that I don't even know answered what we ask. But, and I get it that this is an ongoing situation and I'm not sure that everybody even knows how it's gonna roll out yet. There's some basic framework, but, um, and I know Councilor Butters is gonna have something to say. She may have some breaking news on this, but um, um, what I really wanna make sure of is that, look, we know that uh, medical, or not just medical marijuana, but marijuana will be you know, legal in, is it August of next year? July, July, July of next year. Oh, you really knew that one, Doucette. Yeah. Right on the money. You've been talking about it on TV. <laughs> <laughs> so here's what I, what I would like council to consider. I would like somebody on our staff to be up on this. We're not quite sure how this is gonna roll out and exactly how the municipality is going to be involved, if at all, but I don't wanna, after the fact, July 2nd, all of a sudden be scrambling because we weren't up on what we may or may not be able to do with a whole different things that this may spin off. Um, so I would ask council to consider that we have the uh, CAO appoint somebody from staff to kind of be on top of this, to, to monitor, to, um, to look at what other municipalities are doing. Um, do we have to do something? Um, and it's, you know, not to say it's good or bad, it's just that we need, as, we need to be responsible and we need to be ready for whatever may or may not be going to happen. But if we're not on top of it and don't know what's going on, I think we're doing a disservice to our citizens, uh, you know, one way or the other. I think we should just be ready for when it does happen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Any other discussion? Yes, Councillor? Yeah, it, this has uh, probably been one of the more frustrating um, situations, certainly uh, for some of the Ward 4 uh, people that whose homes are near the, the greenhouses that that grow this stuff and, and really do operate in a very different way that has little rules attached to it because they're under the old system. So um, I, had, I had spoken to um, MP Badaway and kind of asking for his help and I told him like we, we you know, we, the letters had gone from your office and, and I called him again today and said, oh, we got this letter back and it really doesn't address our difficulties here. So um, he was he was in Ottawa at the time, and I just thought he would maybe message me back. But the phone rang, and here he was sitting with Bill Blair, who's in charge of that cannabis file. So I actually got to speak to him um, personally, and I said, like, we are just um, we have just such a difficulty here. The residents that are adjacent to these greenhouses and. And, he's, and he does seem to really understand um, those problems. So he's, he's certainly not unaware of it. And he tells me that, he told me today that, you know, that they are, they're working on it. So they've got the first part to get ready for July 1st and, and it's kind of like all being worked on. But in the meantime, we're, we're the ones sitting behind the proverbial eight ball. We're the ones who are fielding the complaints. You know, it's our our citizens who are putting up with the stench of it, um, especially in the summertime and your windows are open, who can't use their yards because of the smell. And um, so to me, I think we need to, like Councilor Bodner says, like whatever the feds are doing and however that's gonna roll out is gonna, how it's gonna roll out. But if we don't do some proactive stuff in our own municipality, um, and be really up and ready and maybe even look at options that we can do now um, because I'm not convinced, I'm not convinced that that the federal government is, this is all gonna get taken and bundled nicely up and taken care of by them. They seem to have like a little different take on it and you know, I'm not sure what they're, they're gonna do is even gonna work. I just think we need to be ready in our own 
backyard um, to deal with it. Um, so that that's why I really support Councillor Bodner's request, and I hope the rest of council will too. You know, we need options, and I would rather us, you know, go forward and try and do some things on our own, and um, let somebody else uh, expl tell us or prove that we can't. Because right now we have people, in particularly in our ward, that are they're they're really they really are suffering, and it's ongoing. It doesn't stop. And, it, and, it's, and it's ridiculous that they should have to live like that the, how, however long now. I, I'm several years now and no end in sight. So that's our, our request. Any further comment? Mr. Bonner? So I guess you'd need an official request, right? And I, and I guess what, Council Butters, correct me if I'm wrong, but we're just looking for someone to be on top of this from a staff perspective, not us falling upon it by, you know, happenstance. We need to have somebody proactive on this to gather information <clears throat> and, um, you know, just follow up. There's, there's a website at the bottom of this letter that says as new information emerges, um, it'll have to be new information because this website doesn't even work. Um, so I guess there is no new information. Um, but, you know, I feel we should be on top of this. We don't want to have to have our citizens say, what do you know about it? We don't know anything about it. Oh, by the way, they know more than us. So anyways, I'm just asking that somebody from staff have this on their radar, make the appropriate contacts to be sent the information Compile it all in one spot, let us know what's going on, and if we think we have to do something proactive, um, that we, you know, that we may think, uh, or there may be options for us, so whether the CAO heads this or, or somebody from staff, but that's, I think, our request from Council Butters and I, I at least. Like a friendly amendment, perhaps, to the resolution, but uh, <coughs> to include perhaps both of your comments. Councillor Bodner, or Councillor Butters, can you uh, work in uh, some type of friendly amendment uh, that would you is appropriate to cover those areas of your concern? Well, I bring up the area like what my concerns are because that's what our our residents are are dealing with, right? So, to me, if a if a dedicated staff person can be gathering the information and looking at what other municipalities across Canada may be doing, whether that's by their own way of licensing, it could be could be almost anything out there. And apparently there are there are examples of it across Canada where municipalities have taken certain steps. We need to know what those steps are and we need, <coughs> need to know if we can do them here. We need to be ready to do them if it if it seems to be the right thing to do. But that's, that's, that's like about collecting the information and knowing what other places have done and what's been maybe successful or not and what resources are needed to do that. That's the other thing. We have no idea. Well, we have uh, two comments. Uh, perhaps uh, our clerk can draft them up. Pricey and uh, to reach what both of you would like. Um, Mr. Mayor, I, I really haven't um, gotten the exact wording, but essentially I understand the intent of the motion is that um, the CAO be directed to appoint a member of staff to um, monitor, research, gather information, um, uh, look for best practices and other um, resources um, with regard to the legalization of marijuana. Is that a friendly amendment agreeable to both? I think so, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Ashley. Are you ready for the vote? Do you understand what you're voting on? All those in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Mr. Yes, Councilor that. I'd like to have it recorded that in some way that I've abstained from this, that vote. Okay. I'll run to set recorded, uh, abstain from the last vote. <coughs> which 
just accurate. If I may. Um, yes, go ahead. Through you, Mr. Mayor, and just to clarify, um, is Councillor Doucette declaring um, an indirect pecuniary interest in this matter? Because that's really the only way for a member of council to abstain. Indirect. Okay. Direct pecuniary and interest? Indirect. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And the general nature of the um, conflict? Me? Uh, could you just uh, provide me with a general description of the nature of the conflict? Or would you prefer <coughs> just to change, a, to actually vote on the no on the uh, motion without having to get in? I will not vote at all. Let's suppose that. I will not vote. Okay. All right. Then it's a vote for no one. Okay. Pardon, Mr. Bond. Okay. Final item is item number 20, the addendum. Would someone care to move this? Councilor Demery? Sure. Is Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Pardon me? Is there a seconder? Oh, uh, well, I have to, don't I have to read the motion first? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Region of Niagara, re, uh, notice of passing of bylaw to increase composition of regional council. Addition of member for Township of West Lincoln. Triple majority requirement report GM 10 2017, December 7th, 2017. Seconder for the recommendation. Councillor Butters. Before I uh, call for the vote, as part of the discussion, uh, uh, Mayor Joyner of uh, West Lincoln was going to be here this evening. He could not attend, so he sent a, uh, a four, three or four page letter here, which he would like read out. I propose to read this out and then uh, look for further discussion. Good evening, Mayor Maloney, Councillor Staff. My name is Douglas Joyner, and I am the Mayor of West Lincoln, and thank you for considering this change to the regional government composition for the term 2018-2022. Thank you for allowing this letter to be read into the record tonight on increasing the composition of regional government. I want to make it very clear that this process that West Lincoln Council is embarking on alongside with our regional local area municipality partners is not just about more governance, but rather is about increasing the level of service for a municipality experiencing tremendous growth starting in the year 2018. West Lincoln's Council's request to add a regional councillor is a directive of my council and the constituents we represent. Adding a regional councillor will benefit the residents of West Lincoln as it will provide the required representation of regional council to properly address West Lincoln issues and properly represent our constituents. The Township of West Lincoln will be facing tremendous growth during the 2018-2022 term of council right through to 2041 with a projected growth of 29,460 and almost 10,000 new jobs. Economic development, planning and development, water and sewer infrastructure, building of roads and bridges and the creation of a complete sustainable community is top of mind in West Lincoln and requires adequate represent representation to properly address all these issues. The Greater Niagara Chamber of Commerce has indicated that a complete review should be undertaken, and I agree with that. However, I do not agree that there should be a delay in providing West Lincoln with the appropriate representation, and actually the GNCC's letter has stated the same, and I quote, We understand Mayor Joyner's request to add a regional councillor to help him represent his constituency at council, and we know that to do so, would bring West Lincoln's representation in line with what would be expected given the relative size of their population. In short, adding another elected representative from West Lincoln absolutely 100% does equal better governance around the horseshoe simply because there will be another set of eyes and ears at all committees and council committee meetings to digest this volume of material. I defy any mayor from what thorough Lincoln, Grimsby, Park Open, Niagara Lake, Pelham, or Fardier to stand up and say that the additional regional councillor is not beneficial to the constituents of their progressive communities. Quite simply, the workload and reading is simply just too much for one regional representative. I know I personally see the volumes of reading material 
that regional councillors have to consume in a three-week period. These regional councillors' input is invaluable. As the GNCC letter states, West Lincoln has right to explore a government structure that best supports the ambitious goals of the Council and the Council of West Lincoln. Councillors, at this time, you can help West Lincoln achieve its goals and become more efficient in the deliverance of responsible government by approving this bylaw tonight. Park Open Councillors and the GNCC, we give you our word that West Lincoln will show leadership by asking for a change in the composition of regional government in the term of 2018-2022. But right now, we need your help. And in West Lincoln, we see the addition of one regional representative as a start in the right direction. Let's work together as a family. Thank you, Mayor Douglas Joyner. Uh, the problem is they need uh, the uh, passing of the triple majority uh, by the end of the year, and uh, this is the last council meeting that this council has, uh, and other councils are in the same position. So if you're in agreement with uh, West Lincoln receiving another member, uh, and you may wish to consider voting for it uh, uh, again to, uh, that there would be even exceeding our representation uh, the, ex the economic situation in the community uh, would does exceed or will exceed the uh, city of Port Coburn and we do have regional rep two mayor and a, a, a councillor so um, that's for your further consideration Mr. Bonner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I talk in support of this. I, having been a regional councillor as my term of mayor, um, absolutely correct. The mayor could probably uh, speak to this too. There is a ton of paperwork and a, and a lot of stuff goes on at the region that, uh, you know, that as they grow, they'll be hard pressed for just the mayor to be able to. Uh, you know, I think give it the, the proper due. So um, there's certainly a, a, a growing community and everything that's coming their way in the next couple of years. Uh, I think it's proactive of them to, uh, you know, to make this request and I'd certainly support it. Is that it, Mr. Bonner? Any further comment? Yes, Mr. Elliott. I won't support it um, because at some point in time we have to take a look at how the governance model is in Niagara. I, I can see the point in that their, their town is growing, their city is growing. So is Lincoln, so is Grimsby, um, Niagara Falls, Fort Erie, Thorold. And if all we do is keep adding one councillor per municipality as the population grows, adding one makes it 32 at regional council. And then the next time a municipality grows a little bit, they get another one and then it's 33 and then it's 34. And at what time do you stop just adding people because population grows? Or do you take a step back and say, we've got to get into a more rep by pop situation. You take a look at St. Catharines. Um, they've got one councilor per 18,000 people. One, they got 133,000 people, they have seven reps. So each person looks after 18,000. We're overrepresented. West Lincoln would be overrepresented. And at what point do you say, how do we take a look at the way that regional government is structured? Instead of just adding one at some point in time, because everybody admits that the region is growing. And just to keep adding one person because we got more people living here, um, where does it stop? By the time you get to 40 or 45, there's different regional governments that have twice, three times the population as us and have less than half of the regional government. So how is it that they manage and we need to keep adding people to the, to the numbers? Yeah, I, I, think it's, I think it's the way that it's structured. I think it's full-time, full-time counselors. And if that's what it takes, then maybe that's the road that we should go down. Maybe we look at full-time people. 
if the workload is such that that you need to have two people to do a job that one was doing maybe you could get by with one full-time person instead of having two maybe that's the way that that, that we should look at so We are here at the International Flatwater Center today, where community living supporters came out to get behind Colin Sanders and his Million Possibilities solo row across the Atlantic Ocean. A uh, Million Possibilities campaign is all this awareness for people with intellectual disabilities. Uh, Colin Sanders is going to row the Atlantic Ocean approximately around 90 days. It's all about awareness uh, for people with intellectual disabilities. Why do you think this um, campaign is important to recognize locally? I think because people need to realize that everyone belongs in, in a community, no matter who, no matter what we are. Um, just because we have a disability doesn't mean that we're not, we're not like other people. I mean, I think everybody, no matter who we are, have some kind of disability, whether it's bad legs or bad back. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think the main thing is to show people that, it, it is very, that we, are, we are an inclusive community, uh, not just the community wide, but the province and national level. Notre Dame High School rowers participated in the event where they demonstrated the effort and dedication required in completing a 4,000 kilometer trek across the Atlantic. Oh yeah, I would not be able to do it. Like four months on a boat by myself rowing, like, even like just like the weather being by myself. Definitely courageous and like something that as a young rower like inspires us to train harder and see if we can ever make that way. I was actually shocked. I mean, I, I'm adventurous, but I'm not that adventurous. I'm thinking well with him, going by himself. I, I asked it like I thought maybe he would have somebody going with him, like a boat behind him or whatever. And when he said he was doing it absolutely by himself, I was, I was very astonished. Hi, Colin Sanders here. Community Living Welland Pelham. In I also heard that you uh, met Colin Welland personally. Can you tell me about what sort of person he is? Uh, yes, I met him in Toronto. It was uh, before the kickoff date. Uh, he's a really nice guy. Um, he's uh, it's his, uh, he's uh, really excited to do um, rowing the Atlantic Ocean. Sanders is a Port Hope native whose own son has an intellectual disability. He hopes a million possibilities can help contribute towards a more inclusive Ontario. Well, there's a, well, there's like always a f there's always a minor adjustments. Um, it just makes sure that they reach their full potential, and make sure that um, you know everybody has a, a, the exact same opportunities as everybody else. And I think and they get more job opportunities and just just treat everybody with the, the respect and the kindness of everybody else and then I think that would be um, good enough. What more do you think needs to be done in the region? I think um, students, especially with the high schools and stuff, need to um, know, need to get, um, be able to talk to each other and uh, do things together instead of, uh, sometimes you see uh, people that have disability, they're in separate groups than the regular people. And uh, it's good to have the regular people and the people that have disabilities together um, because uh, it, makes, it, makes, it makes community whole. To donate to the campaign and follow Colin's journey, you can visit soloceanrow2017.com. Reporting for The Source from Welland, this is Monica Novak. Lawrence Gowan burst onto the Canadian music scene in 1985 with the Strange Animal album, earning six Juno nominations, winning two of those awards. The source caught up to Gowan before his sold-out show at the Scotiabank Convention Center in Niagara Falls. Lawrence, you don't do a lot of these shows as Gowan. You've been traveling with another rock band, which we'll talk about in a few moments. What's it like to pull out all those old hits? It feels better now than probably when they first came out because they've they've managed to uh, 
to outlive their uh, their prob probably their expected shelf life. <laughs> They've gone well beyond that into decades now, where there are people who uh, relate to them and tell me stories about how much these songs have meant to them over their lifetime. And then, of course, there's the, the most surprising thing is that there's a, a younger generation, many of whom weren't even born when these songs came out, and they they resonate with them as as if they were part of their concurrent with their lifetime. Going back to 1985, you had. Uh released one solo album, Gowan. Didn't really hit the charts. Didn't. Strange Animal came out. Were you surprised at its success? Oh, I, I would be kind of lying if I said I was surprised. I knew it would have some success. And my the reason for that confidence was because we recorded that album in Ringo's house and he was there for the recording of the whole record. And I had Peter Gabriel's backup band or members from that band. <clears throat> and I knew the songs were strong producer really believed in it. Peter, somebody coming into the fire hall or contact with a family member, but the reality of the situation is it's, it's caused some issues internally to our operations, and I'd just like to make sure the council's aware of the fact that over the course of this last year, we've had uh, several sessions uh, to, as to assist our personnel, myself included, with regards to post-traumatic stress. Uh, we've sent uh, representatives of the fire department, as well as our chaplain, as well as our occupation health and safety coordinator for the city, because you may or may not think, but this also affects other city employees in one fashion or another. So we're trying to extend it into the corporation as a whole. And over the course of uh, this past year, we've, we've moved in that direction. Uh, there's been some courses that have been, identif been identified that uh, we're going to implement over the course of the next year that will mean that uh, all of our supervisors, when I say all fire services supervisors, all of the firefighters, and one of the, the missing links that has been kind of gone by the wayside, although not by myself so much, but there's a reluctance, a reluctance from emergency service personnel to want to get their families involved. Uh, we're going to push forward with a program that will allow us to get our families involved so they have an understanding of what uh, the f emergency responders are bringing home with them and they can identify signs of uh, stress that they may be seeing unbeknownst to them as to why it's happening this may be identifiable because of issues that we're trying to deal with and i can give you a recent occasion of where we had a uh, a, ma a major accident in the municipality in the city in the outlying area in which a young man was killed and we had individuals that were directly involved with uh, extricating that particular individual and i, I want to say that uh, our people have, have uh have taken a a, a very active uh, approach with regards to this even though there's a reluctance from some of, of guys who are older and or really young because they don't really understand how it wears you down over a period of time. And I think the simplest way to put it is, uh, and it's, said, it's been said to us through instructions, that it's like somebody carrying a backpack. You take a pebble, throw it in a backpack. You take a pebble, throw it in a backpack, and over a period of time, eventually, you, get, you go to the ground because of it. Some people crash, some people deal with it differently. But that's why we're trying to identify individuals that do need help. Um, it doesn't help the family, and, and I can tell you right now that uh, we've worked very closely with Port Cares over this last year, and, uh, and we're getting a, a better working relationship with those individuals that work and help in this community. And I will say that uh, we have been contacted by the fam or a family member or two, and I will say that uh, they're very supportive of, of the actions that we took uh, during the course of that terrible tragedy. And I'd like to think that they, it's a lesson learned and we're gonna be better for it. And uh, I just wanna say to everybody, thank you all for your support. Council especially have been very supportive of all of the efforts we put into this without question. Even though I, I think there's probably some people that would like to question things. If you wanna sit and talk about it, please don't be afraid to approach me about it. But um, I know Dan has something he wants to bring forward. It came in to him late today. So I'll turn it over to Dan if I could, Your Worship. Thank you, Chief. And uh, something that I just want to inform Council of, my department staff, because we are currently managing the Overholt Cemetery, received a call. If a visual could happen this Thursday dealing with the tragedy in the evening. Now, our current cemetery's bylaw says that no visuals or anything in the cemetery can take place after six. So I just want to pass on to Council that. In the near future, I think our bylaw needs to be amended to allow certain visuals, given the fact of situations. So I just I, I gave direction to the staff to tell the individual to say go ahead and plan for this Thursday. That I was going to bring it forward to council's information tonight. What time on Thursday? 
Approximately around 7 p.m., about 20 individuals. 20 individuals connected with the family that uh, was lost a year ago? Correct. Question of the council to either the chief or to Mr. Aquilina. Mr. Bonner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so do we need to back up Dan with this if, if, if it's a kind of against the rules? Do we need a, the okay from council to, you know, to just say I, I'm fully supportive of it. I think it's a no brainer, but, uh, you know, I think that uh, council should endorse it, let's say. Yeah. And I'd be more than happy to bring that forward as, a, you know, a request to council to endorse it. Um, and unless someone else can convince me <laughs> that it's not a good idea. Is there a uh, seconder for that it, uh, recommendation? Should, okay. Councilor? Can I? Butters? Butters? I mean, I just wonder can I whether ask? I have a secondary <laughs> Councilor Demery, but uh, it's her ward. Can okay. I ask a question of the CAO? Um, are we on the right track with this as far as bring this forward this way, or is there? Yeah, sure. Through your worship to uh, Councilor Bobman, that's exactly right. I understand from Dan saying it was a bylaw, so council can provide relief from a bylaw at any any time by passing a resolution. So I think a motion is a resolution that will backstop the director's decision. <clears throat> Do we want a resolution authorizing the director? Not to enforce the bylaw, or how do you want to word that? Uh, oh, I think to allow it. Ashley has something. Ashley? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I've recorded that um, essentially it's council waiving the rules respecting vigils in Overholt Cemetery in order to allow uh, the vigils to take place. Okay, the motion, motion is moved by Councillor Bodner, seconded by Councillor Butters, uh, but uh, to Councillor just some quick discussion. Is it necessary to have the cemetery attendant there? Because it is after hours. Uh, I don't know how that would work. It, it, is that part of the protocol? Mr. Aquilina, with the city supervision out there? To you, Mr. Mayor, to answer Councillor Doucette, sorry, Councillor Main's question, they do not require any supervision. There's no lock on the to get into the overall cemetery. They don't request or require anything from municipal staff. So I don't think there's any responsibility that the city needs to have insurance that there's going to be potential damage. I, I, I see no issue. Councilor Me, further. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor? Opposed, if any? Matter is carried. Okay. There being no further or oh, any notices of motion. There being none, there being no further business to take care of, I'd uh, call for a motion to adjourn. Council Danch. Second by Council Elliott. All those in favor? Carry. Meetings adjourned. We'd like to move on next to the regular meeting of Council 37-17. Uh, today, Monday, December 11th, following the committee of the whole meeting. Are there any addendum items, Madam Clerk? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, there is one addendum item, uh, that being the addition of item 20, uh, correspondence from the Niagara region concerning increasing the size of regional council. Thank you. The call for motion to confirm the agenda. Moved by Councilor Vladner, seconded by Councilor Main. All those in favor? Carried. Are there any disclosures of interest in the regular meeting? Councilor? Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Wasn't thinking of doing this, but number 19, committee items. Um, I have an indirect pecuniary interest. I'll give this. Thank you. Any other disclosure of interest being done? I entertain a motion to adopt the minutes of the regular meeting of Council. 35-17, held on November 27, 2017. Moved by Councillor Demery, seconded by Councillor Butters. 
The evening is getting long. Determination of items requiring separate discussion. Yes, Councilor. Item 19 for uh, Councilor Doucette's uh, comments. You want that one uh, pulled? Just for the conflict. For the conflict. For the conflict. Okay. Can I call for an approval of items not requiring separate discussion? Moved by Councillor Elliott, seconded by Councillor Butters. All those in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Can we go for a consideration of items requiring separate discussion? Item 19. Uh, Ralph Goodell, Minister of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness, received Port Corbin's resolution regarding medical marijuana grow operations. Second. Councillor Demery. All those in favor? Opposed? And it's carried. Proclamations. Eating Disordered Awareness Week, February 1st to 7th, 2018. Call for a motion to uh, accept that proclamation. Moved by Councillor Demery, second by Councillor Doucette. All those in favor? Can I see those hands again, please? One, two. <coughs> Proclamations. I tell you, the like, evening is getting light. Proclamations. Eating Disorder Awareness Week, February 1st to 7th. Pay his attention. I've got three over here and three over there. All of those in favor is carried. There are there are no minutes of board commissions and committees. Consideration of bylaws, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. That the following bylaws be enacted and passed: Bylaw 6539106617 being a bylaw to authorize the temporary borrowing of $4 million for 2018. Mm -hmm. Bylaw 65401077 being a bylaw to establish penalty and interest charges on payments due to the municipality for 2018. Bylaw 65411817 being a bylaw to provide for an interim tax levy for 2018. Bylaw 65421097 being a bylaw to adopt and maintain a policy concerning the procurement of, procurement of goods and services for the City of Port Colborne and to repeal bylaw 46131404. And finally, bylaw 65431017 being a bylaw to adopt, ratify, and confirm the proceedings of the Council of the Corporation of the City of Port Colborne at its special and regular meetings of December 11, 2017. Thank you. I call for a motion to approve those bylaws in bulk. Moved by Councillor Main, seconded by Councillor Butters. All those in favor? <laughs> Hands up high. That's it. Those opposed? There being none. Pass. <laughs> Yes, sir, it wouldn't matter. I would entertain a motion that we go into closed session. Madam Clerk. The Council do now proceed into closed session in order to address the following matters. Minutes of the closed session portions of the following Council meetings, June 12th, July 24th, August 28th, September 11th, September 25th, October 10th, October 23rd, October 27th, November 14th, and November 27th, 2017. <clears throat> Planning and Development Report 2017-189 regarding the potential sale of city-owned land pursuant to the Municipal Act 2001, subsection 2392C. Opposed or pending acquisition of or disposition of land by the municipality or local board. And C, Community and Corporate Services Clerks Division Report 2017-193, subject appointments to boards and committees pursuant to the Municipal Act 2001, subsection 239-2B, personal matters about an identifiable individual, including municipal or local board employees. Could I have a mover of the motion? Moved by Councillor Demery, second by Councillor Danch. All those in favor? Carry. We move into closed session. I think this time this will be Ashley's last full committee meeting. And uh, I'd like to thank her for her advice to me to keep me on the, on the right trail and also the members of council.